Good afternoon. Uh, we are calling the meeting, regular meeting of the Del Mar College Board of Regents to order at 1 p.m. on Tuesday, June 9th, uh, 2020. Uh, due to health and safety concerns related to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, this meeting is being conducted by video and or teleconference. Uh, the meeting is being conducted in accordance with guidance from the offices of the Governor and Attorney General of the State of Texas and with provisions uh, in the appropriate Texas Government Code section. It's at this meeting, but have been notified that they can view a live stream of the meeting available online or listen to an audio of the meeting uh, by uh, dialing in to a toll-free number. Uh, so the meeting is called to order. In the room, we have uh, Dr. Nick Adami, uh, Regent Salinas, Regent Elva Estrada, and Regent Ed Bennett. Um, what did I say? Salinas. Did I say Gabe Salinas? Yeah. Gabe Rivas? <laughs> I am so sorry. That's, what, that's what happens when I come buzzing in at the last minute. I'm so sorry. Uh, Regent Gabe Rivas. And uh, joining us by, uh, by video conference, we have uh, Regent Dr. Mary Sherwood and Regent Susan Hutchison. Uh, we are expecting Regent Salinas to join us by uh, video conference as well. And Regent Averett is not able to join us today. So we do have a quorum and can conduct business. Would you all please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you very much. much. And Regent Estrada, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And Regent Salinas, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? And if you would uh, join me in reading the Del Mar College vision statement. Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Thank you. Uh, so as I said earlier, we are uh, we do have available uh, folks to uh, view live stream of this uh, video uh, meeting of the Board of Regents with the exception of portions as may be considered a closed comment by statute. We do not have any uh, public comment. The public was awarded an opportunity to uh, provide comment via a toll-free phone line uh, prior to the meeting, and there was no public comment submitted prior to the meeting. So we will move directly into our college president's report. Thank you, Dr. Escamillo. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. This report, this report will be much shorter than last, than last month's, but still uh, packed with some very, very important uh, information. Uh, uh, Regents and everyone listening in from the community, I, I wanted to begin my comments this morning with um, addressing uh, the crisis, which is uh, um, gripping our nation. And I'm talking about the issues with Black Lives Matter and the um, protests and 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 and, uh, um, and demonstrations and and, and, and all the things that are gripping our nation um, it is a long um, it, it is a topic that, that, that would take me would take us the entire day I believe to address but I want you all to know that from my role here at the college and as a responsible, and as a responsible um, leader of, leader of this of this institution an institution, an institution that is built um, on the, on the, on the, on the, the term from the term or as the term of, of democracy's, democracy's college, college um, that, that what is going on, on in our nation uh, affects, uh, affects us all, and that uh, I am continuing, continuing to prepare a statement, a statement to be released, to be released uh, from, my from my office, my office um, in, response in response to what's going on. Going on. Um, um, I am hearing from, from employees, um, a few, a few personally, personally uh, reaching, reaching out to me. me. Um, it, it is an unsettling issue um, that we, as a integral part of this community and the greater fabric, fabric of the nation, um, that we should be not only aware, but, but responsive and responsive, and responsible to, to uh, the things, uh, the that, things are that are going on. on. Um, 
I will I mean, Del Mar College, College has long been, been a part of the, of the, of the efforts, efforts for civil rights, rights advancing civil rights, civil rights well, back well back into the 50s and beyond, and, 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 uh, well, and well after, after that. that. Um, we, we cannot remain, remain we do not remain separate, separate from this. From this. Uh, 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 these occurrences across, across the nation, the, nation, the travesties, travesties that took place, the killings, the killings of certain people, people various people, people, and the years of of this sort of of, 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 uh, of these, sorts these sorts of occurrences, of occurrences. We, do not, we do not um we do not we, do not, we are not going to ignore them, them. Um, we do know, we do it, know affects it affects our faculty our, faculty, our, staff, our, staff, our staff and our and our community, and our community. Um, I'll keep, I'll keep it, it short for today's, for today's purposes, purposes but, I want, but I want you all to know that I am preparing a statement, a statement. I've, written I've written about four, four different, different versions of it. Of it. Because, because I'm, I'm, I'm taking, taking my time, time to make sure, sure that what, that what I put out there is, um, is, do, is, done is done well, well and, done and done very purposely. And, and um, I, just I just wanted you all to know that, that, uh, that, I'm, that I'm working on that, on that and, and, have, and some have some sort of statement uh, for, this for this meeting today. today. That being, that being said, said, I'll, I'll move on to the rest of my report. Um, on, May 20, um, on May 20th, on May 20th um, we received a letter from uh, the governor's office, and the lieutenant governor and the speaker of the House also joined in on a, on a signature page to uh, up a memo with their signatures directing state agencies to implement and cost savings measures to offset revenue losses due to COVID-19 pandemic. You know, they designated agencies. Um, and institutions who and or who are supported, supported and or, or uh, otherwise, otherwise receive receive, receive uh, state, state funds that they must achieve a five percent savings on appropriations for the 2020 2021, 2021 biennium. biennium that's the current biennium that we're in we have a little, we have a little bit more than a year's left, left in this current biennium, biennium. although the directive, although the directive applies, applies to institutions, institutions of higher education, education community, community colleges, colleges were exempt according to the message. To the message. We, have and we have that attached in your, in your uh, packet, uh, packet along, along with the financial presentation. presentation. This, exemption this exemption is a great indication that the governor sees, the governor, sees, governor, the governor and, and the rest of our leadership at the, at the Capitol sees, sees community, colleges community colleges as essential for the comeback of the Texas economy. Based on, Based on similar bills from the last, from the last legislative, legislative session, session, it also reflects the confidence that our state leaders um, that our state, that our state leaders, leaders have in community, community colleges, colleges that and that we are able to uh, um, lead, the lead the state in the way of economic, economic recovery. recovery. The work of the, the, work Texas, of the Texas Association of Community Colleges, community colleges in, which in which I serve as an officer, is particularly to be credited, is, per is, per is partially, excuse me, is to be credited for these favorable factors. factors. In the next, next biennium, we will see we may not be as fortunate. fortunate. As Regent uh, uh, and Ben and I were just talking about, we may or may, or may not be as fortunate. fortunate. Um, so, we um, so we must be vigilant in our planning as we move ahead with our budgets and our spending as we move forward through this crisis, and we must prepare. And we will talk more about that at the budget, in the budget presentation to come. Despite COVID-19 impact, I have some good news and kind of finalizing on what we touched on last uh, last month, uh, the spring 2020 final enrollment was, as I got the, for, for summer one, was about 3% up um, from previous years and even the base year. Uh, the non-certified enrollment was 2.5% was to 3%. I think it was closer to 3% from the latest re, uh, report that I got this morning. It was higher than 19 and even in 18. Also for summer one, this is an interesting, um, we, held, we held on to the 8% increase in contact hours for summer one, which is a very, very strong indicator. Uh, and interestingly, uh, we, we also found through some analysis that we were doing that the summer one students, 97% of our summer one students were persisting from the spring semester. That is a big number. That is a big percentage. And so we know persistence is being affected by uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Some of one classes are being delivered online for general education courses and lecture components of career and technical courses. The labs and hands-on portions of the CT, the CT of the career technical technical education courses are face-to-face -face with health and safety protocols put in place. We continue to advance those classes.
We have proctored, we have proctored testing, testing labs to support online, online instruction, instruction opened, opened um, yesterday, yesterday, June 8th, on the East and West campuses. campuses. What, does that, what does that mean? We're providing We're testing. testing. For those, for those students, students who are taking those online, online classes where typically, typically they, would they would take the classes, the classes they would be able to take, they would have, they would have features on their laptops or their computers, or their computers wherever, wherever they were remotely, they would be able to take uh, their uh, tests online. online. Okay. okay. Not, all Not all students have the necessary software to enable the, the strict proctoring that, is, that, is, that, that, takes that takes place, place um, and, allows and allows students to take those, those tests online. online. So, what so what we've done is we have opened up testing, testing labs, labs for them to come in, to come in and take, take them in a very in, in, in a safe, safe and secure, and secure social distancing, distancing uh, with the social distancing in mind, as well as, well as uh, decontamination and all of those sorts of things. Summer two, Summer two courses, courses will begin on July 6th. And the, and the instructional format, format will be determined, determined, according, determined according to the evolving health, health and safety guidelines. guidelines. Again, Again, it is day, it is day by, by day. day. It, is it is hard to project fully what the plan is, is for summer two still. still. The return to campus, to campus uh, committee, committee continues to meet, and we're it is a it is a day by day, almost hour by hour, hour situation, situation uh, for, uh, for us to determine what the format and the delivery of those classes are. July 9th will be the census date for summer two. That's, That's important, important because, because, for a lot of reasons, but uh, what it'll enable, enable us to do at that, that time, time, we'll be able to then have comparative, comparative data for both um, summer, summer one and summer, and summer two. two. And that's, and that's where we use, uh, our, that, those are our, 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 our biggest, biggest indicators, indicators for forecasting, forecasting for fall the fall enrollment. So, so just, 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 so just so that you these know, these are the kinds of things, things, that, things that we're preparing for. Return to the Return campus, to campus committee, committee uh, planning, uh, planning team, team is now developing health and safety protocols to support the transition to face to face, -to -face instruction. Uh, uh, you know, fall, fall, and fall, fall registration actually, actually began in April. Okay, okay. So we're and so we're preparing in earnest, in earnest for fall. And, and the, plan the plan regarding, regarding the instructional delivery specifics, specifics continues to develop. To develop. So, so again, we're not, we're not there, there yet fully, fully with summer two. two. As, as to how, how the classes, classes are going to be delivered, delivered. fall is just, is just a little, little too far out at this point to to make, uh, make a a full uh, fully, fully developed, developed plan. plan. But it's coming. But it's coming. We, we have, have some ideas, ideas and we are we are staying in close touch with the state uh, agencies, uh, agencies and, and our peers from throughout the state. The college, the college is currently operating under a return to campus phase one conditions. conditions. That, has that has not evolved to phase, to phase two yet, meaning, meaning that the college remains closed to the, to the public and only, and only selected areas are open, are open with restricted access. access. Selected, selected essential, essential employees, including faculty, faculty and staff, have returned to campus to provide, to provide support for summer sessions. sessions. All, All other employees continue to work remotely. We do, we do not have, have a firm date, date again for the resumption of normal operations, operations as I've been implying. Phase, phase one signage with important COVID-19 messages has been strategically placed on east and west campuses. campuses. You've probably seen, seen many of them, as well as, well as the center, of, uh, 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 center for Economic, economic development. development. While on While campus, employees and guests must adhere to the strict health and safety guidelines, guidelines at all time. times, times including, including standard social distancing, distancing measures and the wearing of face coverings. Additionally, all employees, all employees and guests uh, are, required are required to complete an assessment, assessment as, I as I described at the last meeting. meeting. Uh, it's, uh, it's an assessment, assessment acknowledgement, and consent form prior to coming to campus. These, These protocols, protocols are in accordance with the governor's office and, and have, have been verified with the Texas Higher Education, Education Coordinating Board as we've worked very closely with Commissioner um, uh, Martinez and um, uh, Keller. Keller. Commissioner Keller and uh, 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 Deputy Commissioner Martinez. Our, our again, again that, that's and that, bringing that's bringing this to to, 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 to closure. Again, again our, our our focus continues to be on the health and well-being of everyone who steps on campus. Um, um, we are. Um, I want you all, I want you all to know that I'm working very closely. I'm on the I'm on the phone weekly, at least twice, maybe, or sometimes three times a week, with the Association of Community Colleges, and we're working very closely with them to make sure that the association. Uh, is, gathering is gathering the best practices, practices for the individual colleges to, to continue their operations, operations at different levels. I'm proud to say that um, we at Delmar College are uh, at, the, at, the at the forefront of, of, of taking these measures. We're taking very strict measures, where in many cases um, other colleges are offering um, these, um, these protocols, 
as recommendations, as recommendations we are saying they are requirements. requirements. We are, we are requiring anyone, anyone who, comes who comes on campus, campus every, one every one of our students, every one of our employees, and any one of our visitors, to have, to have these, these to take these protocols, these protocols and to adhere to, adhere to these, these protocols. protocols. So they're very, so they're very, they're very tight, tight. They're very strict. They're for, they're for everybody's benefit. benefit. It has, it has, it has everything, everything to do with the, do with the health and welfare um, of, of, of all individuals. individuals. And so, uh, um, just want you to know we're staying in touch. Uh, with our local, our local officials. officials. We continue to stay in touch with the county and the city, and the city officials, officials as well as those at the state capital. That concludes, that concludes my report. I, mean, I intended to keep it uh, brief, brief, but if, I have any, if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer. Are there questions for Dr. Skeet? Yes. Did, did you say a 97% persistence rate from spring? 97% 97 percent, not a persistence rate. If, if I said it in that term, that, that means some, that means a couple of different things. 97 percent of the summer one students came from the spring semester. I was actually anticipating the university students coming in, so I'm kind of surprised at that. So it's actually a small number, and I actually got those broken down, and I'll share those with you. Um, I don't have them. I have them in an email. I can dig them up. And we have them all broken out. I thought there were going to be more. Uh, university, university, university students. students? There's, there's a good number. I think there's, um, I think it's a 64 number or something like that. 64, 74 uh, of our summer, uh, summer one students, students are from the university. There's an uptick there. I, I was expecting a big one. So. I was too, and that's what we were talking about. So I had, uh, 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 because of a couple of those conversations that we had, um, I asked the team to break them out by where they came, and 97% came from the spring. I mean, that's a big persistence factor from from the spring. We are uh, putting out surveys of various different groups, various groups of students right now because we're gathering that feedback. It's very, very valuable, not only in terms of their demographics and so forth, but what are their, you know, their, their experiences, where they're coming from, um, what they're looking for, and all these other sorts of things, and they're telling us a lot. And so we're, we're, we're not... Um, guessing, guessing at these, at these data. data. We're trying, We're trying to be as accurate, accurate as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Regent Estrada, did you have a question? Thank you. Regent Hutchinson or Dr. Sherwood, Sherwood any questions? Good. Okay. I just got um, a, a text from Dr. Silva. I was off by one. 63 students were actually transfer. <laughs> And I think we just got uh, Regent Salinas joining us. I see that. So uh, Regent Salinas, uh, we've been notified that he has joined us by telephone, so he is is on with us. Thank you for joining us, Regent Salinas. Regent Salinas, if you are there, could you just test your audio and make sure that we want to we can hear you when we need to? Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. can. Okay. okay. So, uh, since I can't see you, I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, make sure that you interject if you have a question or a comment when we're we're going through the presentations. All righty. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, sir. Uh, well, first up on our staff reports, we're going to get an af uh, a report and update on our SAC COC reaffirmation and QEP. Uh, Dr. Christina Wilson. Good afternoon, Regent. It's good to see you again. And I'm very pleased to give you an update on how we're doing on our SAC. Thank you. Thank you. On our SAC, on our SAC COC 10 year reaffirmation and also our quality enhancement plan, also known as the QEP. So I know, so that, I know Jessica that Jessica is working, working to get that, that presentation up for me. Up for me. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. I think just give her verbal cues when you're ready for her to move the next slide. You can proceed. Thank you. This accreditation reaffirmation process is a 10-year process, and officially, Del Mar College is the class of 2021. Even though that is our designated year, it's important to know that there's actually quite a bit of pre-work that happens over multiple years. So I'm going to give a brief rundown of what we've done so far, what you can expect, and then also what you can expect and what progress we've made on the QEP. So the first part of this process is to develop the compliance certification. Now I'm going to go into depth about what that is. That was completed and submitted in early March. 
And the second part of that process is what's called as the off-site review. And I'll be talking um, quite a bit about that after we get through the, the overall calendar. The off-site review is when our SACS evaluators take a look at our full compliance certification and they assess whether or not they deem us in compliance based on what we provided. Um, that process, that review took place in late May, and I'm going to give you an update on that in just a minute. The next step after the compliance certification and the off-site review is the submission of our Quality Enhancement Plan, or QEP. At that time, we also had the opportunity, opportunity to submit any focused reports if our evaluators say we need to submit more information on any of the items that we submitted, and both of those items are due in September. Jessica? What, what we, we also need, need to plan for, for is an on-site visit in October, in October late October. This, this is when a separate, separate committee from the off-site team comes on campus, campus and they, they take a look at any areas, areas in which they had concerns in our compliance certification. certification. They also they look at any federal requirements that are required by the Department of Education. They question us about that. And they also review and help us with our quality enhancement plan. Following, Following that on-site report, report, we have, we have the, the opportunity, opportunity to submit, to submit even more information to them. And, and in June 2021, the board of SACCOC, they, they review all of the, the prior processes and they deem us, us and they decide, decide whether or not we are in compliance. compliance. So, so as Dr. Escamilla likes, likes to say, this process allows us to take many bites, bites of the apple. apple. It's a, it's a tremendous, tremendous process, process, an extensive process, process and, we and we have the opportunity to prove our compliance many times. So we're, so we're class, class of 2021, and we're, we're labeled that year because we officially hear, hear of our official status in December 2021, but working up until there, until that point in time, there are many steps. So that's just the process in an overview. What I'd like to focus on next, and go ahead, Jessica, are the pieces we've already finished. The compliance certification is a tremendous, comprehensive process. To get this done, we actually started two years ago, and you can look at it as an audit of all of the college functions, financial functions, physical facilities, teaching and learning, faculty, staff, qualified individuals, integrity, board of regents, they look at everything. So in order to complete that comprehensive process, we really needed to start early. We had a steering committee made up of the executive team, deans, faculty, staff. We had a group of about 40 or so people that met regularly, not to mention all the people that wrote everything. There are 74 SAC standards, and for each of those standards, we needed to provide evidence that we're in compliance. So that's telling our story, documenting our story, proving our story. So all, so all told, told that, that compliance certification that we submitted in early March, in early March contained, contained almost 10,000 items, items of information. information. Our, Our narrative pages totaled almost 600 pages, pages and all, all together there were 6.5 gigabytes of data. So, so I wanted to illustrate that to you how tremendous a process it is and what, what, what a, a team effort, effort it was. was. So, so all of that was submitted in early March, and of, and of course after we submit it, we're on pins and needles. This, this is, is our first bite of the apple, apple and we want to know how did we do, um, um, did, did we give, give enough information, did we forget we ever, anything? So, so as, as I, I mentioned, we, we, um, we did, did receive feedback, feedback. the, the off-site committee did review our compliance certification. certification. This, this is a really timely presentation because I'm really pleased to tell you that out of all of the information that we provided out of the 74 standards there was only one standard that they had some questions about one standing so um this isn't the first time you've heard about this process we've been we've been leading you up to this and it really has been a team effort one standard and in addition to the report that we received from the committee um, we, we read through the report, found out what they had questions on, which were, were, were actually pretty minor. And Dr. Escamilla and I got to meet with our vice president at SACCOC, and it got even better from there. I don't know if you want to describe that or if you'd like me to, how that call went. You start. I'll jump in. Okay. 
So I've got, so I've got, I've got to share with you, we were really, really excited to get that report. The fact, the fact that, that Dr. Dr. Escamilla, Escamilla received, received an email that said, congratulations on the quality of your report, but we were, but we were still really eager and interested, eager and interested to hear what our SACS VP had to say. And within, and within the first few minutes of the call, of the call he told Dr. Dr. Escamilla and I that this was the best and most thorough compliance certification he had ever seen in his role as a SACS COC vice president. Yes. The best. Um, that really, that really tells of all of the, the effort that was put in. And Jessica, if you don't mind going to the next slide. I'm very proud of our college. I'm very proud of our team. We know that we do good work. We know that we work hard every day. But telling that story to other practitioners, other individuals outside of the college, other experts, and proving to them that not only are we in compliance, but we excel at the various aspects of the work that we do is truly a monumental effort. So what you see on your on your slide actually doesn't um, doesn't list every single person that was involved. This is just a small list of people that may have been um, involved are writing team leaders. Um, for every writing team leader, there were five or more people that wrote on the standards. We had editors, technical reviewers, and assistants, technical support. This was a tremendous college-wide effort, and we did very, very well. And I'm very pleased to, to share that with you today. Let me jump in right there, Dr. Christina. I'd like to say, I'd like to say a lot. I, this is. It's incredible. incredible. This is an incredible report at this point. Um, well, let me start with this. There are 74 standards that are addressed. Standard one is integrity. The institution takes on this responsibility, takes on this report with integrity. And I am so proud to say that the level of integrity that was demonstrated with the compilation of this report from this college was stellar and I knew I knew from the bottom of my heart with all my mind and body and soul and everything else um, that it was done with integrity and so with the other 73 items um, were just work <laughs> demonstrating the great work that takes place here when Dr. Hofer told us that this was the best report that he'd seen in his six and a half years as, as vice president of SACS now those weren't just words because it's, because it's very, very, very seldom that an institution will go through the first round and have zero um, areas um, to, 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 to be examined. Just to, Just to give it some um, perspective, the last tenure report that we put together in 2010 and 11, um, when we came when we were at this stage, we received 13 areas of the 74 that we needed to, to clarify and demonstrate, and demonstrate um, um, that, that, that they were, that they were and resolve some minor, minor issues. We came, we came out, out of that, that at, the, at, the at the end of the process with zero recommendations to go forward. To go forward. A, a clean, clean bill of health from those from 13. 13. Okay. 13 is actually a small, a small number compared, compared to the average. To the average. You, there, are there are colleges out there on a routine, routine basis, basis that have 20, 20 25 areas, areas to demonstrate. Um, clarify, clarify, to bring clarity, bring clarity and otherwise uh, demonstrate um, compliance. So I'm trying to give, so trying to give a perspective. We had one, and it is a, and it is documentation, a documentation area. area. And we're going to we're going we're we're to dissect, dissect, dissect that and take it all apart for us as we, as move, we ahead. move ahead. But it's but one. It's one <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Yes, I'm getting, yes, choked, I'm getting up. choked up. <laughs> Sax C O C makes me get. <laughs> Choked, choked up. up. Um, so, so, okay. So, okay, so, 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 so given a perspective, one area, one area it is a it is minor area. area. Dr. Dr. Hofer also, also said, said that he wants our report to be uh, an exemplary report at, at the reference, reference room, room at the, at the annual, annual meeting to be used as a model to, for to, other to, schools. to be used as a model for other schools. This is not just a report. It's not just because it's technically written well. Because it's because it's evidence-based. It's, it's evidence-based. It's, evidence it's proven evidence-based types, types of criteria, criteria that are examined. That are examined. This, is this is the real deal. This is who, this is who we are. are. 
this is this is this is excuse me this is a, a representation of who we are at Del Mar College and what this college is all about. I could not be prouder, or more thankful to the team, to the entire college, all the divisions that came together, every aspect of the college. Instruction, instruction support, support services, services student, 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 student life, support, support services, services, facilities, finances, finances every, every area is affected and has, has to contribute and demonstrate through evidence, evidence um, their, their compliance. compliance. Um, Again, it's again, a, it's a, it's a, it's a monumental, monumental process. process. This is this not, is not it, it, it did take us two years to, to, to compile the report, to come off of the five-year five report, report, as you'll recall, just a few short years ago, years which we did very well on. on. This, this is a 10-year process. process. This is that 10-year process, process that sits over us, waiting. waiting. Um, you know, it just it just feels like it's just, it's always there. And as soon as this one's next, as soon as this one's over, the next one will begin. But, but uh, uh, I just, but we, but we, we are going to take a time to celebrate. celebrate. I don't know when and how, but this, over the course, the course of this next year, year the college will have a, a, a celebration of some kind, of some kind. Um, to, 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 to celebrate this victory. This is a profound victory in the college's history. And I don't know that, I, I just don't know this. I don't know that the college has ever had this level of a report at the first, again, bite at the apple, at the first step in this process. Uh, just, uh, to just to conclude, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hofer um, did also did take, also take uh, this, report uh, this report and the results, and the results of this report to the CEO, to the CEO President, President and CEO, CEO of SAC COC, COC, Dr. Dr. Bell Whelan, a fellow South Texan. Texan. She's very, she was proud, very of proud of her fellow South, South Texans in Del Mar. She's a San Antonio native, native and, a and a friend. Uh, and she was she uh, did get word of it because that's how proud Dr. Hofer was of this report. And, and um, that, 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 that those, those are, are those are very very important words, um, regents. regents. And, and again, again, to the team, thank you all. Thank you all. There, there are many many names there, there and there are many many names that are that are, are not included on this list. But uh, Dr. Christina, thank, thank you for that, that opportunity. opportunity. Thank, thank you for your leadership and your integrity and your leadership on this one. It's been it's made all the difference. The thing that impressed me. Uh, of all of the um, entities that we have to report to, and we, when we talk about governance, and one of the things that, that we, t we heard in our, our board retreat a, a week and a half ago uh, was this idea of a long corridor and the board, you know, setting a vision and mission for the college and, and what your target areas are, but, but down this long hallway are the, are, is the parameters in which, in which the college operates. Um, and, so, so within, within those, those parameters, parameters there's, there's federal, federal regulation, there's state regulation, regulation there's all kinds of applicable personnel laws and FERPA and uh, Clery Act. I mean, all these things that we are subject to at a state and federal level. But this entity is the one that chooses whether, if, if we are not accredited, then our students don't get any federal financial aid. If we're not accredited, our students can't transfer those credits anywhere else. If we're not accredited, there, there's all kinds of, 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 of negative impacts. And so, yes, there's a floor uh, of really bad things that happens if you're not accredited. Uh, but in that process, this entity are your peer institutions, but not just community colleges. The, the SAC COC also accredits every public and private institution across the South. And so we're held to the same standards within our operating arena that Texas A&M University is held to, that Rice is held to, that uh, LSU is, is, is tied to. Every, you know, again, universities across the South, not just across Texas. So to me, that, that's where this really takes on a higher level of importance to understand that the, the, the entity that most directly uh, is a peer-to-peer -peer review of our, uh, of our, not just operations, but our academics and, and everything associated with 
with how we operate the college, to come back with one area in which there are questions. It's not even a finding yet, it's just an area in which there are questions uh, that need some further explanation. I think that is a monumental task, and again, it, it not only speaks to the team that put the reaffirmation package together, but it speaks to the quality of work, uh, Dr. Escamilla, that you and your administrators and our faculty yes. <laughs> and staff do on, yes. on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so uh, uh, I just I, I, I wanted to make sure I give Regents a chance here uh, to make a comment, having received that news from you last week, and this is our first board meeting at which we can discuss it. I did want to take a pause before we get into our QEP discussion uh, to give the Regents an opportunity to, to make a comment, because I think it I think it is a, a just a fabulous piece of news and you're right one that we need to celebrate when we can all come together <laughs> we need to find a, a way to celebrate and in the meantime let's send balloons to everybody or something or <laughs> air, deliver air cupcakes or yeah air, air high fives <laughs> <laughs> so, are so are there other regions like who would like to make comments this is mary um, mary um Having been through, having been this, through process this process a few times, yeah, I definitely, yeah, I definitely um, applaud, um, applaud um, this, um, result. this it's result. It's really amazing, it's really amazing. And, and I really and am really thrilled, for, thrilled the for the college and for everyone who participated, who participated in it. In it. Thank you. That Thank means, you. That means a lot you. coming from you. You know, you know, you know, you know what they went through. Dr. Adami has a comment. Look, and and you know that the quality of the report and and the. And the hours you put into it, you know, says a lot about integrity, which is one of the main things. And uh, again, thank you very much for uh, being diligent. Thank you for your, uh, for the effort of the, of the whole team. You know, it, it says a lot about Del Mar College. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Rivas? I just want to say ditto. <laughs> everything that they're talking about, everything that they're saying, I agree. Uh, this is not my first one, but it seems like it's seamless it makes it look like you i mean it was so like you know you make it look so easy that's what i'm trying to say thank I you i know it's a lot of work and and we appreciate piece of cake we'll do it again tomorrow <laughs> we appreciate everything that y'all did <laughs> and uh, it's important to the college and to our students so thank you thank you thank you regent hutchison Yes, I just want to acknowledge also what a good job the team did, but also to acknowledge that they couldn't have done such a good job without such a fine institution behind it. So hopefully that this speaks uh, not only for the team, but for the college as well. Thank you very much. Other comments? Ms. Estrada? Turn yes. Microphone on. Okay, microphone. Will, we, will we ever get to maybe see part of it, see what it looks like, this holy report? Yes. Uh, I know, I understand it's 588 yes. or 600 pages long, but will we ever get to see? We're very proud of it, and we're happy to share it with you. Okay, mm -hmm. even if it's part of it, I just want to see what it looks like. Sure. Our holy yes, report. <laughs> yes, we'll Thank be happy to share that. Thank you again. Regent Bennett? Very impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all. And Regent Scott, I want to want to share the context that you give it. I'm really glad that you that you gave us that framework. Um, we started the presentation talking about the process, but this really is these are nationwide standards that colleges and universities have to live up to. And I'm so proud of the team. We worked so hard. And it's not just telling our story, but it's making sure that we are serving our students in the best way that we can. And I think that we did that. So I thank each and every one of you for your support, not just today, but at every board meeting, because the decisions that you make and the help that you give us help us to continue to be an excellent institution. So this first bite of the apple was a tremendous bite. It really, really was. So in talking to um, Dr. Hofer, of course, there are um, subsequent steps that we have to take, but we are on a very good footing for completing the whole process on a very positive note. So I'd like to transition to talk about our QEP. And Jessica, if you don't mind advancing that slide Qual for me. Quality Enhancement Plan. Yes, our quality enhancement plan, otherwise known as the QEP. So we completed this tremendous 
audit process, talking about all of our processes. Well, the quality enhancement plan lets us develop and focus on student success, a topic of our choice. So you've heard us talk about this before. I'm just going to give you a little bit of context of what the QEP means for us. It does result in a standalone document. We have been working on it for quite some time, working with our faculty and staff, not just to select the topic, but to select our strategies. It has to focus on student success, and it has to be aligned with what our college is already doing. SACS doesn't want some, some add-on um, initiative. They want us to develop a project that enhances and furthers our student success work. So in other words, this needs to be built directly from our strategic plan, and that's how we've built it. Okay. Here is a brief summary of the activities up until today. So in the summer of 2018, a topic development committee was convened. It was really important to us that we picked a topic that most faculty and staff felt is the most meaningful for our students. Dr. Dale Anderson, assistant professor of speech, he led that process, led the committee, help us to identify our topic. During the fall semester, surveys were conducted, focus groups were conducted, again, to make sure that we were picking the best topic for our students. In the spring of 2019, a final survey, a final vote was taken, and the final topic that was selected was advising. A very comprehensive and very broad topic that I know this group has talked quite a bit about as part of our strategic planning process. So um, another piece of the advising um, project that we've been moving forward is guided pathways. And because of the um, how, how well those two sync up, the committee decided to name our advising project GPS because we're trying to give students direction. And that's an acronym for goals plus planning equals success. So that's the umbrella with which we're developing our QEP. In the fall of 2019, we began the process of <coughs> developing our strategies, solidifying what we want to do for um, advising. And we did transition to a new QEP faculty director, Christine Gademoller, assistant professor of political science. Um, Dr. Dale Anderson took on the role of uh, department chair of communication and reading, so he had to transition out. But we have a great new director. All right. So throughout the spring semester and through the summer, we'll be finalizing our QEP goals and strategies, which I'll be sharing with you here today. And this work is a collaboration between our Guided Pathways work and also our Senda grant, which you've heard about. They sound like they're separate and distinct topics, but they really aren't. It's all about student success, all about advising and helping students, ensuring that they get the support from when they start with us to the time that they graduate. And just to reiterate, in September, we'll submit our, Q our QEP to SAC COC, and then our on-site will take place at the end of October, where, where we'll look at the QEP in depth. we have developed our QEP plan around four distinct goals, two of which you can see on the slide in front of you. The first goal is to clarify students' career goals. Our first strategy is to update our recruitment materials, including our website, to ensure that we are aligning our programs to eight, um, what we call, or what is commonly known as meta-majors, eight areas that are aligned to career clusters. For students who are unsure about what path to take, it's very helpful to provide some structured guidance at the beginning, and part of that has to do with how we recruit and the information that we provide. We are also going to be promoting the use of career exploration tools very early on, ensuring that students identify the field and career that's right for them, not when they've completed 30 hours or after they've accumulated hours, but right from the beginning. Dr. Wilson, can we stop and, and talk a little bit about the term meta majors. It gets thrown around a lot in state and national meetings, but it's not a terminology we use uh, around here very much. And so could we talk about, in general terms, what, what, how you define meta majors and what that means in this context? Yes, sure. So Del Mar College offers over 120 degree and certificate credit offerings. And that's wonderful to have all of these options. But when it comes to a student who's looking for their career path, that can be quite overwhelming. 
And within um, our organization of our, uh, of our administration, our deans, our chairs, sometimes we organize um, our programs based on what's best for us. Like, okay, let's, let's have two divisions, three divisions, but that doesn't make very much sense for students. So the term meta majors groups all of those vast um, degrees and programs into career clusters. That's another way, another way to put it. So like programs and careers um, are grouped together so that students who are unsure about their career path can choose a more general area of study. Health sciences, for instance, someone may be interested in health sciences, or they know they may be interested in the humanities, but they're not sure which path. So, um, so it allows a, for a more general loose grouping for students to explore in before they pick their actual major. So if I'm talking to a, a student who wants to be an engineer versus a teacher versus uh, a, in, in process technology, they're all going to have to take a math class, they're all going to take an English class. And so if you just begin, if we just organize around mathematics or around technical training, then that sometimes doesn't mean anything to a student. So it's real, I think it's really important to, to talk about this from that career cluster standpoint. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the word career cluster because meta majors, I've never quite, that's, just, that's not something that rolls off my tongue, but I like, I thank you for that synonym of career clusters. That means a lot more to me. Here's another one you might like. It's contextualized learning. Okay. Oh, so. that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite word. Yeah. I'm <laughs> so, so it brings context to, to, to the learning, to the fundamental learnings at the lower division at the very beginnings of the lower of the first year and so it starts contextualizing the learning so that so that yes I've got to go take all these math classes but what are the applied or the contextualized opportunities for that math mm -hmm. and so you begin developing those kinds of things for for what area what, whatever area of of interest that they may have is a, that's another way of looking at it. Thank you. And we don't like the term meta major either, to tell you the truth. It <laughs> just doesn't. It just it doesn't mean anything. Does it mean yeah. anything to students? It's hard. Like wh what does that mean? So um, I use that there because that's it's sometimes known in that way. But the way we we're, we choose to brand it with students is your GPS map. What is your GPS map? What are you exploring right now? And it's exactly as, as you said, career clusters, contextualized learning. It's giving some structure to all of these options that we have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the other goal, the second goal as part of our uh, QEP is to follow consistent and effective advising practices. We have staff advisors on campus. Um, some are embedded advisors, some are enrollment specialists, and we have faculty advisors as well who are experts in their discipline. What's very important to us as part of this project is that everyone, whether they're a faculty advisor, a staff advisor, um, whether, you know, whatever department they're in, that they have the same tools available to them. We have, um, we have Civitas, we have um, changes to our catalog that happen all of the time. And we wanna make sure that there is consistency and that um, the faculty, the advisors that are providing services have all of the knowledge available to them at their fingertips. So part of our plan is to, and this is something that's actually started already, is to develop a comprehensive advising training program that, um, that faculty and staff can go through and get certified in and then get periodic updates on regularly. Do we have enough uh, enough advisors, or what is the faculty? I mean, what is a st uh, student load for an advisor? How many students do, would one advisor have? Oh, I wish I I had my Dr. Silva here so he could <laughs> give us that that insight. He's uh, on the he's on the line. Um, I, I, I apologize. I don't I don't okay, have that number. Good. We um, as I mentioned, we have quite a few staff advisors embedded, but typically we rely on faculty advisors to provide that service. Mm -hmm. So I know that we are seeking to improve that load, but I don't I don't have that number. And we also the have the head. faculty advising model. When you think of it that way, we have therefore hundreds of advisors from that capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to the. Um, couple of dozen or so professionals of different types in the uh, student support ranks because uh, at the end of the day, well, um, well, let me not go too far, but I mean, we're all advisors. I was advising a family late last night uh, for a prospect prospective student at, for A&M Kingsville, in fact. So, but that being said, not taking it too far to get to get where you, uh, to your answer, uh, Mr. Rivas, um, if I can get, uh, Dr. Silva, you're on the line. 
Yes, sir. I am in the blank, sir. Can, Can you, you talk me? to us? Talk to us about the number of, of student uh, yeah. student uh, development advisor advisors and counselors that we have, plus the embedded advisors, and and to talk a little bit about those numbers of students, uh, of of employees rather. Sure. Sure. And, and uh, Dr. Skimiask, correct. We have a faculty advising model, so it really varies depending on the departments. So it can vary anywhere from the departments from about 500 to one to about 800 uh, plus uh, at times. We are looking at training some more faculty advisors uh, through the Senda grant. Uh, our goal is to get a 350 to one, which is what is recommended by NACADA, which is a National uh, Association of Advising. And so that's what our, our goal is. And it will come to us through faculty advising process. Uh, we do have uh, embedded advisors. We have uh, uh, in each, uh, most of the departments, and we're adding more advisors through the Senate grant. As a matter of fact, we have three advisors we're going to bring on board within the next six months through the Senate grant that will also help that ratio. Um, so uh, I don't know if you have any other questions. I wonder if that answered everything, Dr. Skimia. Yeah, I was just curious. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good question. Go ahead. Thank you. The third QEP goal is to improve student engagement. And this is an overall goal that touches on all parts of the plan. But we want to require, once our, our faculty and staff are trained, we want to require ongoing interaction. Um, currently, we do have requirements for students to meet with advisors at certain time periods up until graduation, and there is a task force looking currently at what the best model for that is. So we have our faculty and staff trained, and we want to make sure that students make use of, of our trained faculty and staff advisors and meet with them regularly. We also want to provide support to students identified as at risk of not persisting or not completing courses. So that is the engagement piece of this plan. The final piece is utilizing innovative technology to provide advising support to students. We know the value of face-to-face -face advising sessions. You, can't, you, you cannot underestimate the value of the face-to-face -face connection. We also know that students want to get information at their fingertips. They want to know, what classes do I have left? How, how close am I to graduating? So part of our new ERP, Campus Management, has a very robust advising component. So our QEP will be incorporating um, those new technology tools, those advanced technology tools that will help students be aware, even when they are not meeting with a, an advisor, they can check in and see where, are, where am I and what do I, have to, what do I have next to do. So that's going to be a big piece of how we improve our advising processes. Those are our goals in a nutshell. There's some pieces that we are fine tuning, but as you can see, they're big, they're broad, and they have the potential to impact the entire student experience. Are there any questions about the QEP, strategies and goals? Just a general question. Sure. Do the students file a degree plan? Yes. So when the chat catalog changes, they still have that degree plan? Well, depending on when a student enters with us, they can keep that degree plan for a certain amount of time. But as catalog changes, we also give them the opportunity to change their, their catalog year if that benefits them. It's at their option? Yes. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. So as I mentioned, this QEP is aligned to our strategic plan. The KPIs that you see before you should look very familiar. But when we were developing the strategic plan, we heard again and again that advising is the key to help students complete, help them persist as well. So the strategies that we just talked about, we will have a very detailed and granular assessment plan for each of those strategies. But in addition to that, we um, we also anticipate that these actions will impact our bigger picture, such as number of degrees awarded, graduation rates, time, um, average time to degree, and average uh, um, SCH to degree, semester credit hour, in addition to persistence. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so let me tell you the final piece of this, this whole process. We talked about the compliance certification, all of the steps leading up to our final announcement in December 2021, but the next big piece, um, the next big bite of this apple is our on-site visit. So again, it's at the end of October, and we did, um, because our compliance certification was very, very strong, there are not a lot of areas that they have to look at or um, look into for additional information, only one but they will need to look at any standards that are required by the Department of Education. There's just a few of those, a few federal standards that they'll be asking us about. So um, we will be having interviews with our on-site committee and, um, and anything that, that results out of that, that meeting we will follow up on. So it's a, it's a long process and we've made a tremendous start. If I may add, the, Dr. Hofer said on Friday, um, that the on-site review will not, they'll, don't, they'll not be sending a full team for the on-site re review after all, because there's no need to review the finances and there's no need to review the facilities. And they're sending a very, very light team because of the minimal, um, the minimal amount of, of, uh, of, of items um, on, the, on, the first, on the first step of this process. The other thing he said, and Regents, this is, this is um, a congratulations to you all and to others who are, who are no longer on this board because this does go way back. I remember a few uh, legislative sessions ago where student advising was a big statewide conversation and it impacted you, this board here. And it made a bit profound impact on all of us throughout the college. And through conversations here and through conversations at the college, what we found is we're all saying the same thing. What we needed was stronger more enhanced advising okay that's where this topic came from it came from us it came very organically from this institution and i'm very proud of that um and what was also noted by the vice president uh, hofer um, was that the qep was obviously and inextricably <coughs> tied to the strategic plan okay the strategic plan um, that is a big deal. That doesn't just happen. And again, congratulations to you all, Regents, for uh, joining us and being, you know, just, you know, bringing this, this topic together uh, for what is to come with the QEP. He, and then when we threw on top of all of this, we were, we were piling on with good stuff because when we, when we talked to him about the Title V grant, and how when the, the last, the most recent Title V SENDA grant, those are, those are synonymous, Title V SENDA, um, when we talked about those dollars, excuse me, that, uh, that program of work being focused on advising moreover, plus $3 million from the federal government saying, yes, that's what we want you to do and we're going to support you to do, he was just like, this, it, it doesn't get any better than this. So it was a very profound piece. And that... More, moreover, um, the ERP that we're that we that the college chose that you all supported this this administration to moving forward and adopting, and that we're about a year out from a little over a year out from completion. How we integrate that and selected that, and why that why campus management was chosen was because it put students first. It chose students first, and that's what we're doing. They put students on the front end as a traditional, instead of the traditional starting in the back of the house with HR and business and everything. Those, those things are coming. But it was just a, and it was described as a perfect storm of opportunity for the college. And what an opportunity. And, and I'm, I'm just going to say congratulations to you all, to every one of you all, and others who are no longer on this board who were former regents, um, because it came together that way. This is a culmination of years of work and we should all be proud. The QEP is, oh, last thing I'll say, um, um, and, and what's gonna happen with that team when it comes on site is that that team is gonna come with, we're gonna have many conversations before they even show up on October 26th. We will have done our due diligence before they got here, before they get here. But the QEP, once, once we take care of the one item that we have to take care of, um, what we know will happen with that team is that team will examine our QEP and they will be, they will be QEP focused. Okay, good for us, right? 
because as we develop this plan. Um, they will come in and they will check it for all the required standards. As soon as they check all those requisite boxes, they will move quickly into consultative mode, consultation <coughs> mode. They will become our very inexpensive and highly qualified consultants because they want our QEP to be the best QEP that it can be. Okay, pardon all the ramming, rhyming there. But they want it to be as strong as they possibly can. So they will turn into our consultants. Okay, and they will gladly do so because they care very much about this. Again, these, these teams are practitioners in the field. Okay, these are faculty, staff, administrators, presidents, vice presidents, deans, and all the like who compile these both off-site and on-site teams. So good for us on that. And they will be focused on uh, helping us um, at a very, <laughs> I'm gonna use Dr. Hofer's words, at a very nice price. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, that, th those are just great things uh, that come as a result, and it, it, gives, it, let it lets us focus on the future instead of in arrears and looking at things in our past. That's, that's the great oppor opportunity that this remarkable report presents to the college. Thank you. Does, does the Board of Regents ever meet with the evaluators? So, so yes, when, when they come, they, they'll meet with a small group. Uh, uh, what you don't, <laughs> uh, yes, and the, the, the other answer is yes, they'll meet with the whole board when there's problems. <laughs> having done that, having been a reviewer so, so in, in, in North Carolina, <laughs> we don't want to be meeting with the whole board. Uh, there will be an opportunity to meet with the chair and maybe an officer or two. It's a, it's a very small um, part of the meeting, actually and um, we'll set that we'll make arrangements for that and we'll, we'll see what they require of course these standards change over the over the you know from term to term and um, I'll, I'll see what the net what, what the most recent protocol is but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly uh, make afford that opportunity as, as we as we learn more we'll see what the latest is reason, the reason I was asking because the onside review would be 26 29th I'm not sure when the AC, ACT Congresses in Chicago. Um, I can don't have the date with me. End of September. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Usually it's in October, but I guess they're doing it earlier. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know what we do is we time this as late as we can, yeah. frankly, in hurricane oh, season. Yeah. Okay. That's really how we do this yeah. because they always want to come in September, and they know from the coastal counties that they push of all the schools because they're evaluating dozens and dozens of colleges and universities mm -hmm. medical schools throughout the year and so we push it as late as we can into fall without getting too far into november and then the, the holiday season and so forth so that we can avoid hurricanes hey knock, i'm, I'm just gonna stop there yep. i don't want to talk about hurricanes mm -hmm. right now any other questions Thank you again. Uh, I'm really glad for the timing of this meeting that we could share this great, great news. And as Dr. Escamilla mentioned, we're really excited about the QEP. Because the compliance certification was so strong, we really get to focus on student success and strengthening that plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Christina. Thanks to everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, we are going to uh, Call John Stribos up on the presentation list. I don't know if John, you're going to turn on your um, your camera or not. I'm going to let Dr. Dr. Escamilla introduce our next item, which is the 2014 Capital Improvement Program update. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The 2014 Capital Improvement Program update is also known as, internally as the reconciliation of the uh, 2014 bond. Um, we've been trying to get this to you all. Um, I hate talking about COVID-19 and the impact, but it has just permeated every aspect of, us, of, of our operations and, and um, where we wanted to bring this to you in April and May. Uh, we've been delayed by a few weeks, but that being said, um, um, we wanna talk about uh, the capital improvement program uh, projects um, that have been completed and those that are in front of us. And so Mr. John Stribos is our Vice President Chief Facilities, uh, Physical Facilities Officer is with us. And he uh, is gonna talk about um, the project's reconciliation from the, um, from the financial side as well as the physical facility side. Oh, John, are you with us? Yes, sir, I am. And uh, I'm gonna let y'all watch the presentation. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. So this is the update of the completed projects 
the financial financial information comes from uh, the finance office. So these are your completed projects: the central plan upgrades, phase one and phase two, and that total uh, total. These are total project costs, soft costs and hard costs, right at three million dollars. The Richardson Auditor Auditorium flooring, two hundred fifty-six thousand dollars. The Vintner's Fire Alarm Project, $213,000. Master Plan for the South Campus, $1.6 million. The General, General Academic Music Music Building, right at almost $60 million. Workforce Development Center, $20 million and a half, $20.5 million. Emergency, Emerging Technology Building, $11,780,000. That total is almost $97 million, which represents about 62% of your 150, almost $157 million worth of bonds. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. These are your projects that are in process. So you have the pilot plant project in which you authorize bond funds to be used for. You have the fine arts music building renovation, the Harwin Student Center renovation, the re-roofing packages one, two, and three, the Helen Fells renovation, Memorial Classroom Building renovation, the White Library renovation, Heritage Hall demolition, General Purpose Building demolition, West Campus, several different projects, paving, asphalt, go back signage, lighting, fire alarm, and IT improvements. The East Campus and Edge, signage, lighting, fire alarm, and IT. You have the budgets for those projects, and then from all of these, they're still at about $8.2 million in contingency that can be used on these different projects. So that subtotal of projects budget that's left is about $60 million, or about 38% of your total budget. Next slide, please. So some details on the projects that have been completed. The uh, central plan upgrades, right at $3 million. Phase one, the East Campus, started on April 27th of 2016 was finished on September 22nd, 2017. The West Campus started on September 21st, 2016 and finished on June 20th of 2017. Next slide. So these are some photos of the central plan upgrades. You see the West Campus, the Dykin 600 ton chiller. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. These uh, central plan, the Emerging Technology Center, <coughs> final project cost, almost $12 million, start date of May 25th, 2017, substantial completion on August 28th of 2019, 27,041 square foot building. Next slide, please. And so these are just some photos of the, the building itself. I'm sure you've all been to the building uh, and been through it. That's next year view. Next slide. And then just an interior view. Next slide. And the hallway views. So the building turned out really nice. And the next next slide, please. You have the Workforce Development Center. Final project cost twenty million five hundred and fifty one thousand five hundred and thirty one dollars. Start date of March 17th of 2017, substantial completion on December 30th, 2019, 48,000 square foot building. Next slide, please. Next here, view of the building. Next slide, please. Interior view of some, one of the labs. <coughs> Next slide, view. And this is uh, looking towards the welding building on your left, the welding wing. Next slide. General Academic and Music Building, final project budget, $59,519,476. Start date was May 8th, 2017. Substantial completion, December 31st, 2019. 136,162 square feet. And everyone's moving into that building. We're working through warranty items on the building. Next slide, please. You have an interior view of one of the classrooms. Next slide. And some additional interior views of the classrooms, the hallways. And next slide, please. 
the next steps to move forward with this. John, can you hold and, on? Uh, John, sure. Let me, let me jump in there. Uh, Regents, these pictures are obviously dated. Uh, uh, those those pictures had some uh, incomplete construction in there, so those are those are older pictures. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, we did have the general academic uh, um, building and music phase two. Uh, tours. You all did get to see that one. We obviously we had to, we we're going to have the dedication for the Mike Saldua Plaza in April. That didn't happen. Um, and was also being set up was uh, tours for the Workforce Development Building as well as the ET. Obviously, uh, I don't want to say we hit the brakes, but we hit the clutch for sure. And so we lost a lot of momentum during the course of this semester. And so that's why these buildings are probably not familiar to you all. So we're bringing to you all uh, photos. Uh, but I assure you they're complete and there's a lot of uh, incomplete flooring and some other things there. I'm not so worried about the picture so much as just a reminder of what the things, so many things that we have canceled as a result are going to be rescheduled uh, for uh, as a result of COVID-19 and um, you all be getting updated in, in tours of that uh, in coming um, weeks I guess <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let you know but um, that being said John continue I apologize for that I just needed to jump in there on that. Yes, no, no problem. So our next steps for these projects that are in process, we've advertised we're going to use an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, IDIQ, request for qualifications, it's number 2019-20, uh, and it was advertised in the fall it's for architectural and engineering services to support various Del Mar College projects. So we'll identify those projects, architects and engineers, and bring, be bringing that back to the board, uh, to the regents uh, in the future. And then after the architects complete the construction documents, we'll advertise for competitive seal proposals for the construction of the projects, and that would also be brought back to the Board of Regents. Next slide. So some of what we're working on, we have draft space programming reports for the renovation projects. We'll work to finalize those. We'll clearly define the scope of work for the projects so that the architects that are selected can begin work, begin the design work. Almost all these projects may or may not have asbestos. Asbestos is a yes or no question. If it's no, we don't have to do anything. If we do have asbestos, and we probably do, we have to do a bait first before we can start construction, whether it's renovation or demolition. Next slide, please. So there's a preliminary schedule. In the uh, blue, you see construction and the green design. So in general, you've got the physical, the uh, pilot plan is under construction now. We'll be pouring the slab, ideally this week. We lost a little bit of time because of rain. The uh, design on the project should take about six months, what you see are fiscal year quarter. So right now we're in quarter four of our current fiscal year, and then September 1st starts our new fiscal year, quarter one. And so you see those designs about six months, give or take, and then construction. <laughs> Health and, fails, health and Fails Renovation has to wait until after we have finished um, Health and Fails and into Memorial, but we can start that design work at any time. Next slide, please. Uh, and so that's kind of a high level overview of your 2014 bond. Questions? John, the uh, this is Gabe Rebus. The, the buildings that are already yes, complete that they all come in under budget, and if they did, how much money is left over on that right now? So if you go back to the slide that shows the uh, projects that are in, in, in process, you have a total contingency of eight point two million dollars, and uh, some of these, and so it's that's rolling all the contingencies left over into one bucket. And in working through these projects, I'm going to work with Raul to give the more specific details that we can follow up with exactly how they compare to the original budgets to the final budgets. Some of them were a little bit under budget. Some of them, I believe, were over budget a little bit. So in, in that, in that um, John, let me help you with that. And I know August is on the phone and Raul is on the phone as well or on the, on the, uh, the go-to-meeting. Um, the the number none of the numbers surpassed none of the budgets surpassed the contingencies if i'm if i'm not mistaken i know the bids came in under and then there were a few change orders along the way uh, that were all approved here but 
August, if you can help me from a historical standpoint, um, every one of the projects was within the um, contingency amounts, correct? Uh, yes, sir. This is uh, this is August Alfonso. Uh, if you recall, each of the project has a contingency uh, of ten percent, in addition to the original budget, as well as uh, the twelve percent inflation and a fourteen percent uh, administration costs and design regulatory testing. Uh, permits and things like that. So, yes, sir, in, in, in those terms, the way John has presented by the reports from our finance department that each one falls within the specified uh, scope of the budget. Yep. His, his comment about some went over where we came to you all with change orders that, that crept up into the contingency, but still within the overall budget. So, so I want to make sure and clarify John's Still, you know, he's only been here a few short months, and so he's having to absorb a lot of history real fast, uh, very quickly, and so I just want to make sure and clarify that. Um, and yes, sir. And we still have enough money to complete the other projects like the held and fills? Yes, and so those are those are the next steps, and, and we, there's, if you can go back to that slide, um, I forget who's, who's controlling, I don't know who's controlling here, the slide that talks about the, that, that, uh, that has the summary numbers at the bottom on the budget. We're still talking about the eight million plus the allotted dollars for several projects. Let me wait to get that. There it is. That's the slide. There you go. So those are the projects that are remaining. And what we are going to do and what we're going to talk about here in the questioning, we can just use that, leave that slide up there so we can use it as a reference point about next steps. Regents, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm excited about is bringing to you all that, um, you know, last year, last fall, we went out for um, a, a procurement it, with a procurement method of IDIQ in which we were uh, able to have a selection process to set up our uh, our teams um, basically on a lineup, if you will, uh, for selection of, of these projects. Of course, Mr. Stribos wasn't with us back then, but uh, he knows this field very well. He knows this, uh, this procurement strategy very well. And so as such, um, our next steps uh, for you all's consideration, there's no approval today or anything. This is an FYI and a reconciliation that we've been, um, been working to bring to you all. Um, we want you all to take this and look at it, and if you have any other questions, please, you know, after this meeting, feel free to call. Um, but that being said, um, our next steps are really about um, um, working with, with uh, Mr. Stribos, uh, who is a professional engineer, uh, to help us uh, bundle these programs, these, these, these remaining projects um, properly and appropriately. So that we're not out there with, you know, 14 different um, packages, okay? A lot of these works are closely associated. So there's a couple steps. So we're going to, so we're talking about doing an IDIQ and bringing back a recommendation of who, um, who uh, on the uh, architectural and engineering side can handle certain bundlings of these projects, some combinations of these projects because what we want to do is come to you with three or four. John, am I, am I, am I accurate there? Three or four bundles yes. of projects? Yes, that is correct. Yep. So John's recommending three or four packages that include um, very complementary um, projects within, within this uh, listing that we have here and uh, present to you all for your consideration the combinations of these particular projects in about uh, amounts of 10 to 14 million dollars each, uh, as I recall. Um, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I'm I'm following what you've. What you, You're correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. So about 10 or 14 projects, and what we want to do is make recommendations through the ID IDQ, ID IQ process. Um, uh, what our recommendation is to move ahead for the architectural and engineering um, teams to handle those. And then, as John said back on the uh, other slide, uh, we would then take these out um, for competitive seal proposals. Um, in other words, go out there for bid on these various packages. And so those are the next steps that we're looking at 
um, bringing to you all. And John has told us we can do it as soon as next month. I don't know that it's uh, for the because he's been working on this. He's been working on the, on the on the bundling and so forth. He's not done yet. It wasn't it wasn't appropriate for this meeting, but next month may be a little soon. But uh, August might be um, even better. So those are the next steps, and we need to answer a lot of questions right now. We're we're Mr. Bennett. Looks like you have something. I, I do. I, I like what I'm hearing about the approach. Um, I I am a little bit confused, and, and I know there's there's an answer to it. We, we've got the construction contract like for the music building we, we approved 45 million dollars for construction but it came in at 59 million because there's other components to that do we have a listing of what those other components are absolutely we have the okay. full breakdown to the penny dr kathy west um, has the breakdowns of the a and e that's the construction component mm -hmm. and then the first part of the, the other component is the architecture engineering all the various engineers and all the professional services that it that takes place with the and I knew that was in there, but but I haven't I haven't been able to find it. Yeah. So we we have that breakout uh, separate that, that is all the backup. And let me tell you, uh, it's 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 much deeper than that because with that with every transaction has permissions, it has approvals and permissions and communications and so forth. So we have all that backup. I, I know you've got the detail. Yes. But I'm I'm just looking for the summary. Get to from. 40, that's easy. 45 up to 59. That's easy. That's okay. easy. Uh, Dr. Kathy West has that. Uh, Dr. West, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so did you hear the request? Yes, and okay. we have a very nice report um, that has all that information. Yep. We've, we've got extensive, extensive uh, detail going back to from the quantitative to the qualitative yeah, all I, the all I, the I've been looking at eBuilder and you've got all the detail in the world I, I would like the summary yep it's coming it's coming well I'm letting the other regions know I'm just so, describing so perhaps it to next time that this comes back that could include a summary of of where we started where we are today and and how how you what you roll up into those those big buckets and numbers so that we all have that information duly noted yeah. duly noted are there other questions or comments what I would like to ask for from a kind of a planning standpoint is uh, perhaps in our next agenda planning meeting uh, we can look at the schedule and the calendar of our board meeting so that we understand what is coming down the pipe and, and, and kind of be prepared for those decisions because it looks like there's going to be this is going to be an iterative discussion you're bringing us a little up to date now yes but then over the summer and into fall and into fourth quarter of 20 uh, there's going to be some decisions so let's understand the, the process and the kind of the schedule of what how those decisions are going to come back to the board a more specific timeline with with those we wanted you all's feedback to to, to see what uh, because i got a one reaction already it was a vision it was a it was a face reaction uh saying when i said that uh mr stribus is uh ready to come back as soon as next month with some information that's he, he is he is um He's very efficient and uh, very, very um, effective in, in his role. So it, it's up to the board. We can we can come back next month with the next iteration of this. Um, uh, if if you just give me a, a few weeks, I'll I'll or give me a few days rather. We don't have weeks. Um, I can um, have that. Um, I can test that a little bit more and and see if, if if July is appropriate. But it can come back as soon as July. I would be interested in, and I'll, the rest of the board would be. Uh, understanding the space programming decisions that you're making around Heldenfels building sure. and Harvin Center yeah. so we can understand from a public facing standpoint and, and, and student inter interface standpoint those decisions that you're making I just think that would be something that could could warrant a, a public uh, discussion and exclamation explanation, explanation. There we go. <laughs> yeah so so it, it that would be a, a um a fun um a workshop um that we can actually dive into those details and really start unpacking the purposes of these next projects and 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 i think when we do the the, the, the packaging or the bundling bundling mm -hmm. um that we can talk about those kinds of things and so if y'all are amenable um, at one of the next meetings, one of the next regular meetings, and we can take that deep dive. We are we are ready. All the programming has been done. 
Uh, we've been, in, ter in, in other words, what uh, our professionals, Doug Lowe with Facilities Planning Group, um, helped us do is sit down with each respective user of, of the projects out there with these with these various projects and and uh, talk to talk about the spacing. And we can even ask him to come back and help us with that presentation as an option. But I'll leave that up to Mr. Stribos. But um, certainly we can do that as soon as July. Great. Any other questions or comments from any of the regents? Thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to uh, a discussion of our Del Mar College bond ratings. Uh, we had some discussion about this at our previous board meeting when we um, had the des decision to go out for bonds, but I think you've got an update for us. Is Ms. Keyes or Mr. Garcia going to lead that discussion? They both are. They both are. Yes. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board. Let me begin with thanking the faculty, deans, chairs, student support services, instructional support services, the leadership of the college and the board for working very hard with transitioning the academic and support services to a health and safety environment. This incredible body of work was very well received by the three major bond rating agencies that we met back in March uh, 31st. Today, I have for you information regarding our bond ratings. Next slide, please. Okay. So as I previously mentioned, on March 31st, Lenora Keyes, Executive Vice President, John Johnson, Controller, Dr. Kathy West, Director of Accounting and Budget Officer, Dave Gordon with Estrella Hinojosa and Company, and I spent most of the day meeting with financial analysts from Standard & Poor's, Global, Moody's, and Fitch bond rating agencies. The purpose of the meeting was to provide them with both financial and non-financial data about the college. The college delivered a 21-page PowerPoint presentation with a narrative around the college's financial agility and resilience in this COVID-19 environment and a recession. The analysis the analysts responded very well to the college's budget management, financial performance, financial strengths, the new CARES Act funding and financial stability plan that includes the establishment of a risk management reserve. Our talking points included uh, our liquidity levels, which has increased by as much as $18.3 million since fiscal year 2017 and the college's unrestricted net position before the OPEB and pension GASB adjustments. Equally important to the analyst was the college's quick, quick response to the COVID-19 crisis that included transitioning our academic programs to an online platform. We also talked about our student support services during the crisis that included delivery of Wi-Fi access in our parking lots, 24 seven tutor services, 24-7 library services, intrusive advising, and delivery of laptop loaners to our digital divide student population. The analysts were also interested in our local economy. Lenora, can you uh, please speak to this item? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, of course, this, the analysts came to us with a perspective of the impact that COVID-19 had had nationally on our entire economy, uh, and actually worldwide. So they were very much up to date and looking for how our local economy had been impacted. We were fortunate to be able to share how we are a more diversified economy, recognizing that the oil and gas industry has been very hard hit. Uh, we, were, we were able to bring out that over 10,000 construction jobs still exist in our region. Uh, with you include uh, Gulf Coast Growth Ventures and uh, Portland has not slowed down. Share Energy and um, Steel Dynamics are all still going strong and directly impact our region. We added the fact that we see ourselves as a tourist industry and even though the larger economy has been impacted by the lack of the opportunity for families to travel, we see ourselves as a summer destination which expect our uh, local industry and retailers to uh, benefit from. 
we added the, con uh, the impact of the Corpus Christi Army Depot and the other areas within our economy that are fully diversified. With the Port of Corpus Christi has been impacted, however, they still remain the fourth largest uh, or greatest exporter of liquids within the country. So overall, our economic activity looked very strong in relationship to the rest of the country. So this was uh, well received by all three of the raters. Thank you, uh, Lenora. So um, I have to admit, uh, the meeting with the financial analysts who have a pulse on our industry combined with a backdrop of a COVID-19 crisis and the beginnings of a recession was a bit nerve wracking. However, the college team was pleasantly surprised when Dave gave us some feedback at the end of the day. And I quote, this is what he said. You all did an outstanding job on the presentation and in managing the COVID response. Nice work explanation points. So now let's transition into the comments made by the bond rating, rating agencies about the college. Next slide, please. So the team was once again very pleased with what the bond rating agencies had to say about our college. The following are a few highlights. SFP reported the college has sound financial position with growing and solid reserves. They also said the debt burden remains moderate. Moody's reported healthy position with the expectation that it will remain stable going forward based on budgetary expectations. They also said the college's pension liability is expected to remain manageable for the foreseeable future. Fitch reported the college will remain will maintain the highest level of financial resilience despite sharper impact of the US GDP declines. And they also said operational flexibility is derived from the district's sound budgetary control. So those are just tidbits of what was reported about the college. Are there any questions? Okay. I wanted to point out for a minute that uh, yeah. Fitch ratings, additionally, on one of the criteria rated us a triple A. Uh, the overall rating, of course, was a double A plus. However, to get a triple A on operating performance was uh, very, uh, very good to hear. It was an excellent uh, rating in the middle, in the middle of the report. Yes. Thank you, Lenora. So uh, now let's transition on, on the bond rating uh, itself. On the next slide, please. All of the three bond agencies rated our bonds as double A with a stable outlook and our bonds have been classified as the highest investment grade. The college received the second highest bond rating from SMP and Fitch and the third highest bond rating from Moody's. And what does this all mean? The results uh, will make the, the 2020 AMB bond issuance more attractive to the investor and will also reduce the total interest financing cost, my estimate is by as much as 1 million in year one. And this is relative to the, uh, the bond issuance of the 2018 AMB bonds. However, more to come from Mr. Dave Gordon on the bond issuance in the July board meeting. Next slide. So this concludes my presentation and, and Lenora and I's presentation. If there's any questions, uh, please let us know. I do have a question. I apologize for not, this is Carol, not asking it uh, a few slides ago, but back to the rating agency comments. Uh, when they when S and P talks about the debt obligations remain moderate, uh, is that a comparative term to other community colleges? Is that a comparative term to where we've been previously? What do you know? What uh, can you tell me? What the basis of that comment is? Yeah, you know, I would have to circle back with Dave, but my 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 guess is when these bond rate, uh, rating agencies. Um, really particular entity, uh, they're really focused on the overall outlook of a specific industry. In this case, we're higher education. So my assumption would be is relative to other institutions of higher ed, 
uh, that uh, are bonded is relatively moderate. Okay. And then uh, uh, the slide before where it talks about the college's yep. financial strength and the fund balance reserve excluding our GASB adjustments. So I assume that that is yes. standard practice for higher education in this in these kinds of presentations. Yes, so uh, I think um, a couple of uh, years back when the the first uh, introduction of the GASB uh, uh, for pension and other post retirement benefits, uh, a lot of the bond rate rating agencies took the position uh, that uh, when they would analyze a specific entity that they would uh, factor out uh, these particular adjustments. And even when we talked about the KPMG uh, KPIs a couple of months back in their, in, in their assessment, in their uh, modeling for KPIs ratios, uh, they also take the position of excluding those adjustments to better present the financial performance of, a, of an organization. Okay, I just want to make sure that that is a, I was making an assumption and I want to check my assumption that that is standard practice uh, across the um, across the board for institutions of higher education. Okay. Any other questions or comments? No, it is very impressive. I think. Thank you both very much. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Garcia, you you're going to stay on the line so you can give us our budget update. Uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. Dr. Escamilla, do you have some introductory remarks before he starts? Oh, just we, we continue to uh, bring you uh, up, to, up to date, Regents, with um, where, where, where we are with the budgeting process. Obviously, uh, timelines have changed, uh, variables have changed, uh, but I want you all to know that uh, from my standpoint, as I've been working with the uh, with the uh, finance team here, that the college remains in very good, solid ground. Um, and and some uh, some favorable um, uh, decisions and co and considerations from the leadership at the state of cap uh, for the, uh, the state capital certainly are adding to uh, our, our our firm footing, relatively speaking, going into this next fiscal year. Uh, again, just a, uh, another update, and we're going to continue to update you um, monthly and even weekly into uh, August uh, until we conclude um, the budget uh, before September first. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the Board of Regents, uh, the college continues to move forward with planning the 2021 budget year based on the best available information. What is certain today is that the economy has shifted gears towards a, a recovery as a result of reopening the economy. We also know that the uh, community colleges like ourselves will play an important role to the economic recovery, which is why uh, we, we believe uh, Governor Abbott continues to support community colleges. Next slide, please. Next slide. And next slide. There we go. Thank you. So let's begin with the budget timeline to determine if the dates continue to make sense. I will ask that you turn to the July and August dates. We are at the final stages of the budget process that starts with a budget workshop scheduled for July 14th. On this day, the college will deliver a five-year forecast, the pre-final draft of the budget, and property tax levies. For the month of August, public hearings on the budget and tax proposals are scheduled, followed by dates for the board's approval of the budget and tax levies. Before we move on to the next slide, are there any questions on these dates? Go ahead. Thank you. Next slide, please. The college is planning for a flat operating expense budget valued at $107.9 million. This is zero change to the 2020 budget. This will not be an easy tax task, but it starts with stretching our dollars towards financial stability. The college will scale back operating expenses by freezing open positions and only hiring essential positions. We will also consolidate open positions and broadening staff responsibilities. And uh, there will be reductions to travel, non-essential and critical equipment purchases. Savings from these strategies 
in the 2021 budget year will, will be redirected to fund changes in the employee compensation and certain non-salary operating expenses. In addition, the college is currently scaling back operating expenses in the current 2021 budget year with the intent of funding a risk management reserve with an estimated value of five to seven million. The purpose of this risk management reserve is to manage unexpected revenue shortfalls or expenses in, in the coming years. Are there any questions? Just a quick comment, Regents. Um, again, this ties back to my initial comments, uh, going back to uh, the information that we're receiving from uh, the state leadership and the various meetings that we're having, both through the CFO and the CEO groups for community colleges. Um, by way of the Texas Association of Community Colleges. In, in, in other words, the information that we're getting there is that we're good for this next fiscal year from the state standpoint. Um, the subsequent um, biennium is where um, there's not enough information for them to give us uh, solid uh, forecasts, but they are asking us to prepare for uh, reductions in um, uh, state funding. When I say we, they're talking about all state agency heads and all state uh, uh, supported um, institutions. We fall in the, under that uh, umbrella. Again, we don't know if we're going to stay under that umbrella or not, um, but at this point, with as Mr. Garcia started off with this very, very specifically, based on the information that we have today, this is the best uh, forecast scenario that we have uh, for you today. Again, it is a month by month. Uh, situation. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Okay, so this, we should be on the proposed salary increase slide. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. All right, the budget plan includes a change in employee compensation valued at 750,000 consisting of faculty compensation valued at $505,284 and non-exempt compensation valued at $245,464. The proposed change in employee compensation hinges, hinges on prudent fiscal management efforts, the final 2021 budget revenue plan and the amount set aside in the risk management reserves. More to come uh, by our uh, by the time we, we deliver our uh, budget workshop. Mr. Garcia, let me jump in there. Regents, yes. um, um, this, this particular slide here tells a very important uh, story in that you know, these numbers are the same numbers that we are projections and our estimates um, that we've set forth uh, for the next budget um, some weeks ago, um, amidst the, the, the most, um, some of the more tense times that we've been going through w with COVID-19 um, were when we set these numbers. Again, it's a, it's a modest um, pay increase, and I know it's at a very difficult time. Uh, I understand that. I, I have to be candid, and I have to be uh, uh, upfront about, uh, about all of this. Um, you know, the, the exempt and non-exempt um, categories uh, we have here at a 1% um, raise in salary, and then we're talking about uh, experience pay and the, 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 t the typical three components um, that are established for faculty that are, that are written into year-to-year -year policy. Again, all of these were proposals. Uh, it's still, only, quote, only June. Um, and we were we were testing the economy. We we were prepared and remain prepared to adjust um, these these uh, these proposals, uh, initial proposals, very preliminary uh, at this point. Um, we wanted a baseline, and we wanted to start here. Um, we do uh, ask and encourage any questions at this point. Uh, we do know uh, we are responsible. Um, to not only our community, but to our employees and so forth. And um, we need to, uh, if you all have any concerns or questions, right now is the time that we, in, in the month of June, that we want to hear. Regent Bennett. One question. 
we were anticipating a $750,000 increase in pay. And is that incorporated into the prior slide where salaries remain steady? So this is Raul. So the goal is to remain at the $107 million. And you ask, how, how do we, how do we uh, fund this? Well, it's through fiscal management, where we said we were going to scale back some operating expenses uh, and, and then realign some of the uh, budget line expenses. So that's how we're going to fund uh, not only this salary expense, but also the preliminary increases that I'll shortly discuss. So I guess if we can go back one slide to the one that says preliminary expense budget. There we go. Sure. Yeah. Oh, those look the same to sure. me. Uh, yes, 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 they do. <laughs> and so we, we still haven't finalized this particular report, but I would ask that you envision an adjustment where we are reducing uh, the non-salary uh, expenses, which is the 25 million nine hundred thirty six thousand and this particular for this particular case it will be reduced by seven hundred fifty thousand and we will adjust or increase uh the appropriate line item for faculty sal the related line item for faculty exempt and non-exempt salaries thank you mr garcia now i understand completely yes sir so yes, future future iterations of this will the the numbers on the right the preliminary budget 2021 those numbers will change. What you're working towards is the bottom line in bold, the total projected expenses remaining flat. Yes, ma'am. Correct. Okay. Yep. Uh, We're on the uh, same page. Uh, July meeting, we should firm up these numbers for you. Questions, Regents? You can continue, Mr. Garcia. Okay, thank you. So moving on to uh, other preliminary increases slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right. So the budget includes an increase in non-salary operating expenses valued at 1.2 million relating to insurance, electricity, and election expenses. This amount is subject to change based on the final negotiated energy contract. The, co the college is working with Traditions Energy uh, who has reported the college can capture today a lower energy rate that will save the college anywhere from 380,000 to $430,000 per year. This savings will materialize in the fourth quarter of the 2021 budget when the new contract starts. Are there any questions on this? Just a quick question on the energy contract, if I may. Um, it's gonna, that item right there is gonna tie into the next uh, staff report under the review of professional contracts. We have it in there as an asterisk. Um, it is a, um, it is asterisked because um, it is not fully formalized, as Mr. Gar Garcia is saying, but we have a great opportunity for a tremendous amount of service, excuse me, savings, tremendous amount of savings from a very, from a, um, a relatively long contract with this, with a company. So we, we have advisors working with us. It's a very nuts and bolts operations kind of thing. But uh, Mr. Garcia um, has, has, is going to talk a little bit more about that at the next meeting. So these two items are tied together. And hats off to Mr. Garcia for, 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 for getting out there and uh, aggressively negotiating uh, for savings on that front. You'll see what I'm talking about here in a little bit. Is this a new company? Yeah. So, so thank you very much. But it's really attributed to the team, which includes, uh, includes Mr. Stribos and, and David Davila and you know, John Johnson and, and Kathy West. So the, 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 thank you. The question was from, from Regent Estrada was, is this a new company in, that we're dealing with? And it's a, the, so talk, a, can you just talk, talk a little bit about more about the company that's, a, it, that they're a consulting company, not an energy company at this point. Can you talk a little bit about that? That, that, is, that is correct. So our current vendor is with Constellation. Uh, I, I, I'd have to dig in a little bit deeper to determine how much history we have with them. Uh, but we're now looking at Traditions Energy, which in, in my opinion, um, I get the sense that it's a well-rounded service uh, 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 consulting com energy consulting company, and the way I, the, re the reason I say well rounded is because when we talked about their services, not only were they coming to us with better a better rate structure, but they also were talking to us about 
you know, other types of funding mechanisms like grants that we can take advantage. And so they can help us identify uh, those external source of funding uh, to leverage in some of the construction that we're having or to uh, introduce some energy uh, savings type of capital projects. And so for me, that was an overall big picture uh, uh, added value service company. And so um, that's why I think um, it would be a good company, a uh, good partnership. So again, a good consulting company, partner. again, a consulting company that we're working with right now is helping us find these tremendous savings and, the, and these great opportunities uh, with the electricity contract. Again, it'll tie to the next agenda item here in just a little bit. So that's Thank who you. we're that's who we're dealing with right now. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, Thank you. All right. So we continue to vet uh, various data points that influence our tuition and property tax revenues, with the expectation that we will firm this up for the budget workshop schedule for July 14th. However, the state appropriations revenue budget is more definitive. As reported earlier by our president, the college received communication from, gov from the governor regarding a 5% reduction in funding. It was welcome news since the college had already planned for a 1.6 million or a 10% reduction. But it got even better when the same letter indicated that colleges were excluded from the 5% funding reduction. Community colleges. Our budget plan for state appropriation revenue is flat. Okay. Uh, next is the tuition and fees. We'll stay on the same slide, please. I'm sorry, moving back. Yes, thank you. The assumptions for tax and fee uh, revenue. For our next major revenue stream, the college is uh, planning for a flat tuition and fee revenue. However, this is subject to change based on the results of the spring and fall term enrollment with considerations given to historical enrollment trends. As reported by our president earlier uh, in the meeting, the enrollment outlook is, is looking very promising uh, and it is no surprise based on historical enrollment trends. Uh, but we'll know more about the enrollment by July 9th. A little bit more on the historical trends. When looking at the historical trends, there's a pattern in which the college's enrollment will change in concert with the unemployment rate. This trend is attributed in part to students wanting to retool their skills at Del Mar College in order to regain entry into the workforce. In the case of the 2008 recession, the Nueces County unemployment rate scaled up and peaked at a rate of 8.2% by May of 2010. During the same period from 2008 to 2010, the college experienced a 15.8% increase in student contact hours. The college is anticipating similar enrollment patterns in our current recession environment in which the unemployment rate for the Nueces County has scaled up from January's 4.5% to April's 9%. The college will once again fund this tuition and fee revenue based on July's 9th enrollment information and will report back to you on the July budget workshop. The next assumption is uh, property taxes. Mr. Garcia, can I say one thing real quick? Yes, sir. Back on the tuition and student charges is the, the term that I like to use, but tuition and fees assumptions there. Um, what's out there in the press regions is something that's very important, and I, I've been uh, uh, asked about this in the in the uh, in the community, and that is that these the major universities are reducing their summer uh, charges, the student charges, their tuition, and so forth. And they're at, and I've been asked point blank, are you going to do the same? And the short answer is no, because of the affordability factor that we have built into our mission. Okay, $69 a credit hour versus four times that amount at the universities. It, it is not the same. The instruction, much of the instruction is the same. The charges are not. 
And so I want to be very clear about that. I'll answer any questions or concerns that you may have, but I want you all to know that every one of those issues that I'm asked about in the community, I'm, I'm responding with these sorts of things. And I want to be completely um, uh, candid and, and, and upfront with you all about those kinds of situations. I'm very proud of the low uh, tuition that we have. It remains at less than the, than a less than a third, and somewhere in some places less than a quarter of those charges. But those are the major institute, major universities that have, I'm just going to say, billions in 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 endowments and so forth. Not the same. It's not the same scenario. So sorry about that, Mr. Garcia. I just had to add that. Uh, it's okay. Thank you for sharing. Uh, for the third major revenue stream, uh, the college is really doing its best to lessen the tax burden. Uh, during this crisis, we are planning for a total net tax in increase of eight tenths of a penny. Eight tenths of a penny. This includes a decrease in the O&M tax rate of six tenths of a penny, offset by an increase in the debt service rate of one and four tenths of a penny. This is after factoring in uh, the 2020 A and B bond issuance. The college will continue to vet this further. More to come on this by the July budget workshop. Any questions on this slide? Let's not pass that over too fast. <laughs> I'm sorry. I absolutely, yeah, thank you, because I think your um, the ability to hold the overall operating budget flat to look at a potential M and O tax rate decrease. And I realize our effective tax rate is is uh, the combination of the valuations and the the tax rate. But to go in to be where we are in this process, and for you all to be uh, looking at the the prudence that you are to keep to, to potentially decrease our M and O tax rate, uh, understanding that the voter approved debt service tax rate is going to increase as a result of of again those obligations to the to the voters to finish those projects. I think that's that's a tremendous amount of work that you all have done, uh, and I think you should be commended for that, to, to recognize where we are as a community, where we are as a state right now, and to be holding everything as tight as you can. Yes, ma'am. And if I may add, uh, Madam Chair, is we've, we've heard you all as a Board of Regents. We've heard what your expectations are. We knew there were challenges coming in, and going into this year, uh, things were going to be tough. Um, we're not done yet. It's only June. Um, there's, uh, the, the, we will resharpen the pencil. Um, but what I'd also like to add is that this is also, as was submitted in your in your packet, in in accordance with um, the expectations uh, from the governor of Texas. He asked. He sent to my office and to me as the agency head. It's the term that they use. Um, to to follow such things, I'm I'm pleased to say we were doing this before I received the 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 letter from the governor's office, but um, in his in his statement and in his document that is there for for everybody's viewing, um, in the packet, in public and, and for the public to review, um, he said that he said that um, debt service um, uh, had to continue. And then that there would that that, that 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 was a separate item, but to do everything he could, do everything you could to reduce as much as you could through the M and O. We were already doing that, and when we received that as affirmation, um, um, we were very proud of that. But it started here. Those conversations started before I received that letter from from our governor. It started here with the conversations and the expectations from you all as regents. So I want to thank you all uh, for your continued guidance, and then also to say. We're not done yet. It's only June, so we're we're still flexible both ways. But uh, we 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 know what the um, what the goal is here, and we're not done yet. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on this preliminary revenue challenges and assumptions? This is what we've asked for for years: was to to be, have these these discussions early on, so that we understand the assumptions going into the budgeting process. So so now is it now is our time to to argue and discuss and come to resolution if necessary, so, all right. When, when do we expect the early appraisals coming in, July? Late July. Um, we've, I've been in regular contact with Mr. Canales. Um, I wanna say at least 
several times a month. Um, but um, and um, the appraisals are coming in with these estimates right here, plus some 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 um, ours are more conservative uh, estimates than they're giving us at this point. But um, it'll be very late July before we get the final numbers. I would like to understand um, as we finish up the the budget process over the next month and a half. Um, as you as you're working to keep the overall operating budget flat, um, what are you deferring? I think it's going to be an important conversation. Uh, you've already talked about from a, a personnel standpoint that you're going to you know tighten up some positions and not fill some and combine some positions in the short term. Uh, but I think it would be important for us to understand if there is any deferment of of any kind of activity so that 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 again is it, the board is, is aware of what those those management decisions are so absolutely and and that'll really come in the detail of the what we're hoping to bring to you i don't know uh, par pardon me if i steal your thunder mr garcia but i think it's appropriate right now is that in the development of the risk reserve fund uh, there are details that come with that and what we're what we're looking for you all's um uh, feedback on and in that um we'll also include um steps taken that you're describing madam chair that uh, that we that we have been taking and and where the um, um where the reductions would come from again uh we're, we're at the end of the day we're estimating a flat budget and it's really about going into the next fiscal year with the uh, as close as close to as we can uh, the same uh, the same budget as last year with the idea that you know we have some um, wiggle room one way or the other but that um, that uh, based on the information that we have right now the capacity that we have right now with the variables that we know um, that it'll be very similar oh what I meant to say was that based on with the capacity that ha we have right now that we would go into to next year's budget and hold off on I, uh, items such as travel and non-critical equipment and those kinds of things. So we'll, we'll bring that detail back. I'm, I'm, I'm going off the rabbit uh, on a rabbit trail too far, but uh, um, we'll have that detail for you. Any other questions or comments? Please continue, Mr. Garcia. Yes, Madam Chair, noted uh, on your on your request, and, and we'll put that. Uh, uh, we'll be ready for you uh, by the Jul July workshop. So moving on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, this is just, uh, if we just look at the total, obviously these lines and items are, are subject to change by the July uh, meeting, but we're trying to still hang on to $107.8 million in revenues. More to come on that in, in the July meeting. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, so what is the question was what is what is being deferred and maybe this next se section will help um, uh, formulate or put some thoughts uh, on, on the subject, but uh, you know um, you know I want to say that our budget thus far is built around the best available information with a stable financial outlook. However, let's consider the college's financial resilience in a worst case scenario of a decline in revenues by as much as $3.5 million. This includes 850,000 in property taxes, 1.1 million in tuition and fees, and 1.6 million in state appropriations. The college can easily manage this $3.5 million shortfall based on current budget plans that calls for prudent fiscal management efforts that includes scaling back operating costs and establishing a $5.7 million risk reserve using the 2020 uh, savings. Uh, but you say, okay, what else is out there, right? Uh, so if we set up a $7 million and we come in with a $3.5 million short fund, there's still some money in the reserve. Okay, let's talk about it. Well, that reserve can definitely be, can serve future, future years where there is a strong possibility 
of state funding reductions in fiscal years 2022 and 2023. So what we're doing today is we're really planning for a three, two to three year period outlook in trying to manage and navigate through this recession. Uh, and so, um, so that's, that's all I have. Are there any questions on this particular slide? I have a question regarding uh, policy around the establishment of a new fund and is does that come to the board for full action is it considered a management reserve fund or it because it is i, I, I want to make sure that that we have an opportunity to discuss parameters yes uh and and within our policy how that's established so that's that's what i was trying to say last time and, and so that's what we're going to move ahead at the next meeting and do okay. so we want to unpack that we're going to we're going to look at all the uh the the, the um requirements for uh, the development of such fund. Of course, it's not like anything else we have, and so we're going to look at all uh, the requirements for it. It's different than the plant fund mm -hmm. um, because it's it's we're going we, we are facing uh, the crises that we are facing. We are entering a a recession. We don't know for how long and so forth. So we're gonna what we want to do is we want to develop a concept with you all. We want to unpack the parameters of it all and also establish the permissions and or notifications that are that are requisite for required for um, such a, a fund so we want to unpack all of that for you all at the next meeting and get get into those specifics so spot on on the question thank you for that one um, and it, it'd be a, a an opportunity and, again, and one other things that I'd just like to add for that is that whatever dollars that would come out in uh, that, that would be put into this fund um, but we want everybody to know that we understand that they would be one-time dollars okay we understand we're not building a, a, a risk reserve fund with the idea of having continuing dollars you're talking about equipment you're talking about one-time equipment or one-time one-time costs uh, types of scenarios again we'll we'll unpack that I know the finance team is listening in um, to uh, this conversation and so we'll pick up on on the uh, questions um, um, for uh, uh, for the next meeting, other items such as insurance claim deductibles and those kinds of things. I mean, it's 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 one-time expenses. Again, we may we we are planning we're we're planning for a, a long winter, if you will, um, after this fiscal year, and also smaller con uh, uh, shorter contingencies along the way to to get through this next fiscal year. More to come, Mr. Garcia. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next slide, what, what you have in front of you is the uh, uh, Governor uh, Abbott's letter, and we've uh, highlighted, if we can go on to the next slide, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, there you go, thank you. So we, we provided you with the Governor's letter, and we've highlighted uh, certain things that relate to, to, to community colleges, and, and essentially what it is is, you know, the, the governor has been great. He's excluded community colleges, he supported community colleges by excluding us from this 5% uh, uh, funding re reduction. On top of that, uh, he's allowing us to continue to, to move forward with our uh, 20, uh, 2020 AMB uh, bond issuance. So, uh, you know, uh, so we're, we're definitely, our outlook is definitely looking very positive uh, in this particular One crisis. More. more to come. Mr. Garcia, we, we want to show the highlighted areas for everybody. If you can show the next slide, please. There, there, there you go, okay. right there. These are the um, excluded uh, funds, funding for debt service requirements and bond authorizations, appropriations uh, to, uh, these are the ones that are excluded from the 5%, okay? appropriations to health-related institutions and community colleges. Health-related institutions are the medical schools and the various types of profession schools. So there it is very uh, plain to you. The other thing too I, I just like to add is just the, the amount of the immense amount of pride as a as a community college president um, that we're having that for the for the governor and the leadership to have in supporting um, us and the great work that uh, the trustees and regents and, and the presidents are doing at, at, at at the Association of Community Colleges is is just very <coughs> evident, and we're really, really advancing um, our mission. Um, this is a great show of support, <coughs> and we're very proud of it. So we, we want everyone to see this, um, and that's why we have it attached for your review. 
Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Please continue. Yes. Uh, so if there's no other questions, uh, that concludes uh, this uh, presentation. Other questions or comments? Thank you very much, Mr. Garcia. Appreciate it very much. Look yes, forward to the you. next iteration. <laughs> you, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to a uh, review of our professional services contract list. Uh, Dr. Escobedo, do you want to introduce Ms. McDonald? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this next review is, is um, in accordance with our pending list, uh, annual pending list, and we want to come back to you um, as, as we have uh, been doing over the past several years to, to present to you and have for your review um, the, the list of professional services that are out there. Again, the only thing that I would like to add is Oh gosh, I can't see it. If I can't see it, excuse me. Is that there? There will be an asterisk on the energy consultant <laughs> contract, if I'm not mistaken. It's located at the very bottom, Dr. Okay. Samuel. Yeah. Let me just hand it over to uh, uh, Miss McDonald to do that. But I I do want to um, talk about that. We'll come back to it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Miss McDonald. Thank you. Good afternoon. As Dr. Sabia said, this is a pending list item that we bring back to the board to review um, twice a year. I believe the last time that we did review this was last October. So there have been some um, changes. Um, it is color coded. So if you notice that if there's something shaded in the light yellow, then it is uh, a contract that will be expiring this year. Uh, we do not have any anything with the date adjustment, so that does not apply. And then if it's an orange, that means the contract has expired. So I'm going to go down and just kind of review the ones that, that will be expiring or have expired and if you have any, any questions. So the first one on the list would be um, Weaver, our internal audit. That contract will expire um, at the end of August of 2020. We move on down. We have Estrada Hinojosa, Bond Advisors of the McCall, uh, Parkhurst and Horton, which is a bond council with Estrada. Uh, that contract expired. Um, also in mid-May. Then we have Wells Fargo, which is our bank depository. That will expire at the end of August of 2020. I do believe that is on the regular agenda item to address that today. Be if before, you, we um, from, before we move from that. Continue to move. Yes, ma'am. But yeah, before we move from that slide, can we talk about uh, the process for um, these contracts that have or are expiring within a few months? Are they I mean, if, staff going to come back to us for recommendations to re renew with that? What is that timetable going to be? Well, right now on um, any of the contracts that have expired or are expiring, like I said, the Wells Fargo is on your on the board agenda today. We um, at this point are not um, unless it's it's something that Dr. Escamilla and, and um, instructs me I'm not bringing a Weaver contract or an internal auto contract back at this time. Um, it does not have any more extensions on it and we um, have not anticipated to put out put that out for an RFQ. I think that's something Dr. Eskimi can speak to is um, possibly as the need for that arises this next year, we could also do it on an individual project by tro project basis moving forward. Um, that is something for the board to entertain. Um, I know that Mr. Garcia is working with uh, Strata Hinojosa and the McCall Horton to um, bring those particular contracts back to you. And then, like I said, Wells Fargo is on the list of the board today. Okay, so um, because the Weaver Group reports to the board as, inter as our internal auditors, um, I think we do need to have a discussion and, again, uh, as opposed to just audit, to bringing staff back, what is the process for a review and a decision either to enter into an RFQ or to, I, I, I think we, Dr. Escamilla left the room for a moment, so we're going to have to bring that back for a discussion. I see Mr. Bennett has a comment. Well, I have a question. I, I think Weaver files a report with the state that's required. Correct. Okay, so I'm concerned as how we could not have them <laughs> with a contract. Right. Well, they will be, um, this particular year that we're in, Weaver has, this spring, they have been um, conducting some follow-up audits in, I think it's five different areas. Those will be brought to the board 
and they will report those follow-up audits, internal audits to the board in August. And then they will also, at that time, bring you the overall annual report back to the board in August. So they will be providing the board with the current in, the current information for the follow-up reports and then also that annual uh, summary that does have to be filed with, with the state. Okay. Um, Dr. Escamillo, uh, we're talking about the Weaver contract and, and the, uh, that it has reached its five-year with extensions uh, lifetime. Um, so I'm, I, this is, if this is a place that is appropriate for us to discuss this and give guidance, yes. I would personally not be interested in um, deleting our internal audit function. And I know that the board spent a lot of time uh, prior to me coming on the board working through the internal audit process and whether or not we could find somebody qualified to bring in-house and the decision was made to go through the RFQ process and bring an external internal auditor in <laughs> or a contract maybe a better way to say is a contract internal audit yes, uh, team in um, and so I I think that that requires a board decision to uh, not continue with that function and, and I want to make sure we have an adequate place to discuss that. Yes, yes. So this is why uh, this, this listing was so important. So thank you for that opportunity uh, to open up. There's two pieces to, to this. There's actually maybe three. So uh, the conclusion of this contract does not mean that auditing stops, per se. Okay, because we, um, as you recall, there was a function that fell under Weaver's umbrella that took a deeper dive into our IT world. Okay. And 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 so, as you recall, um, we talked about pulling uh, that particular function out and preparing um, for um, a deeper, much deeper dive in in the auditing of our IT capacities, all aspects of IT. So we've begun that process um, through our government procurement contracts and so forth. Um, we uh, engaged. Um, Columbia Advisory Group, also known as CAG, and um, who is world-class firm. I mean, it's it's CAG and Deloitte and those others that are out there, and we've begun engaging them uh, for preliminary assessments. And so the, the the assessment has just begun, although the functions with Weaver, um, uh, we still need some approvals, and, and it, it is a board because of the relation. Uh, ship with um, uh, Weaver and 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 it, that function of auditing with the board it it will come to you all in, in coming weeks for final consideration but what we wanted to do is list it today prepare the conversation get you ready to have a, a formal conversation about next steps as we conclude um, and then also talk about the component that is going to continue uh, with CAG and we want to we want to tie those two things where we are with Weaver in the next in the next few weeks and where we are with CAG or, or Columbia I should just Columbia yeah Columbia Advisory Group and we want to talk about those two components as we're moving ahead so um, we're we're right now um, off well preliminarily speaking we're gonna have to take a deeper dive in this where we do believe that Weaver has been with us for several years and and and, and, and conducting really really nice deep dives into our processes and we're better for it and so forth um, we think that there's an opportunity to shift focus and actually contract and focus in the IT area because there'll be lots of opportunity for continued auditing there and and talking about a, a longer term um, um, forecasting for for auditing at the college so so big, lots of cons lots of discussions still to come uh, Weaver Columbia Advisory Group how they mesh and how they overlap because they don't mesh I apologize how they're overlapping and what their functions are they're coming is uh, Tammy I'm sorry I'm, I apologize I had, I had to ste step up but did you talk about the August timeline Yes, I yes. did. I okay. did mention that uh, Weaver will be coming uh, to the board in August, and they will provide about five follow-up internal audits that uh, they have been conducting this spring in five different areas. And we're very close to, um, and basically, we're going to recommend closing out several audits because we're that close to to whittling down to basically no findings or minimal. And then they will also be presenting their annual report, their annual summary that we do file with the state auditor's office. Okay. So that will be in August. 
Thank you. And again, I apologize for I had to step out. Um, so, um, so Madam Chair and Regents, I, I want you all to know that that, that is great timing um, for us to, to, to put all of that on the table. It is absolutely board consideration for how we proceed with that. Uh, we're going to talk about recommendations and what our experiences were and, and what, what our assessment of, 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 their, of their scope of work is and has been. And then we want to talk about steps going forth. Again, um, it is for um, you all to discuss here um, on the... Um, on the Weaver side, the other IT piece is a kind of a subset. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different animal <laughs> um, that we need to move ahead on, and we've already begun engaging uh, the initial assessments with that group. So we, we can tie both of those together in the August meeting. Regent uh, uh, <laughs> that particular. I, I do like what you're saying about the IT. We we talked about that a few years ago. Yes. My concern with Weaver is that we've had discussions about internal control weaknesses recently, and they still exist, and they always exist. And that internal audit function is so valuable. We're, we're looking at $257,000. We, we can lose that amount of money real easily by not having an internal control Understood. function of, of the internal auditors. Un so, understood. So I, I, have, I, I have extreme concerns about not having them on a contract okay so we're that's why we're talking about it today and that's exactly what we want to hear um, from the regents and and uh, the discussion is still um, on the table and uh, that's what that's why this this list is important and I wanted to um, add that asterisk item on there to talk about the IT function because if um, you know the threats that are out there that exist in all forms, be it financial and IT, and those things that are both IT and financial are, um, they are ever present, ever present. They are, they are there constantly. And so um, we want to talk about that, and we'll, we'll, I look forward to a robust well, discussion about how to proceed. So, uh, so what I would, I think I, what I would like is if, if it's possible to let's have the start of that discussion in July sure and then when Weaver is here in August uh, but but I don't know that I want to wait until August when they're here trying to give us a report to also then have a discussion about Understood. whether or not we're continuing the, the function if we are going to continue what's the process to continue if we're not going to then then what's the process to stop but I think it's important that uh, 30 days less than 30 days out of a, a contract that we already anyway i think we need to make some decisions and to either keep the ball rolling and i i'm i'm i agree with with regent bennett here i'm concerned about um not having an internal audit function yeah i apologize i missed that before that. Yeah. before i got in there uh before i came back and so um so we were we were talking about the the possibility of that uh, and i did talk to tammy about that prior to that so all things were on the table and we're understanding where where it's at we'll bring that back as a staff report uh, combined um, from um, both Ms. McDonald and Mr. Alfonso to talk about all aspects of, of the internal well, audit. Well, and I think there's a potential we have to have a, some closed session discussion on uh, the IT versus the internal audit pieces sure. to make sure that what we're we're talking about we can we can talk openly about given some oh, absolutely. recent issues. I see Dr. Sherwood has her mic open. She has a question or comment. Uh, yeah, I just you actually said what I was going to say, Carol, um, which is that I think we really need to look at this in July and not wait till August and have that discussion before the the contract is up. I would have concerns about not having um, this renewed. Duly noted, Dr. Sherwood. Yeah. And we would have to go out for an RFQ because the contract yeah, does not have any um, additional extensions that are offered on the contract, so it will it would have to go out for an RFQ um, or some other type of process, you know, a process. Yes, ma'am. I'll be more reason to talk about it sooner. Duly noted. And um, we will bring um, both functions from those two different, um, those two different groups um, in a, a full report for you all next month. Okay. Great feedback. If more questions, please. This is the feedback I was looking for. And then sep separately, um, but, but similar kind of issue, if Estrada Hinojosa's contract and, and the bond council has already expired in, in May of this year, um, then I think we need to have that discussion about going, obviously we're gonna have to continue to re retain 
uh, financial advisors and bond counsel. So is that an RFQ process that's going to, and tell, tell, what's the time period on that one? We, we don't select the bond counsel, do we? Correct. I, well, I don't know. Usually the, the financial we, There are some distinctive those. processes, and I know that those will be brought to you. And I know Mr. Garcia is working on that with um, bond counsel. Uh, and that information will be brought back to you soon. And uh, I know that there are some specific guidelines that we have to follow when it has to do with um, bond counsel. So I know that Mr. Garcia is working on that, and we will be bringing that back to you also. They bring their own. When do you think that's going to come back? Uh, 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 Mr. Garcia, can you talk about that? When is that the Estrada and Hosa contract? Yes, yeah, so, so the original contract had two one year extensions. Uh, that uh, uh, that went through, I want to say, through the end of uh, May. I would have to double May check. May 14th. It. It's on our chart, yeah. May 14th. Okay. Yes, thank you. May 14th. And so uh, so we, we had exercised the, the extension, uh, the one-year extension, uh, right before we even went uh, forward with the 2020 A and B bond issuance. Uh, was not able to find the, the contract with our bond council. My guess is there would also be an extension there. I also talked to Tom Spurgeon. Uh, he couldn't find the original contract either. So I, for, for, sake, for, for the sake of uh, precautionary measure more than anything else, I, I think we need to move forward with, with uh, issuing another. another contract. This is also my understanding talking to Tom that uh, the state, uh, under, the, under state statute, there's certain language that allows us to uh, contract uh, a bond council directly without having to go through an RFP or an RFQ process because of their specialized uh, expertise. But more to come on that. So acor according to your chart here, though, their, their contracts have reached the end of their seven-year, five-year plus two one-year extensions a month ago. So my, my point is, I think we need to, have, again, have that full discussion. Um, I would think that after seven years, it would make sense to have an RFQ. I know there's there's lots of financial advisors out there. Estrada Hinojosa is wonderful, but I think we ought, we also owe it to ourselves to have a discussion about the RFQ process. So, Mr. Rivas, you had a... I, I just wanted to say that I believe that they bring their own bond counsel. We can okay. recommend who we might want, but usually they bring their own... But those two, those two are hand in hand, so they, yeah. their, their they terms yeah. expired at the same time. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely there is, a, there is a section, excuse me, there is a section in the bond advisors contract that does reference bond counsel, and there is a section that does speak to if uh, they provide bond counsel, then they pass the cost directly on to us with no upcharge. So there is, there is language in the bond advisors uh, contract that does speak to engaging bond counsel, yes. So I guess we'll hear a report on that one in July as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Continue, Tammy. I'm sorry. That's right. Thank you. If we go to, to the next section, um, from here on out, we're going to see quite a few because mm -hmm. since um, Mr. Strivos um, presented earlier, you see that a lot of our projects have ended. So uh, we have some contracts that are either going to be expired or have expired that are related to those contracts. So the next one I would speak to would be Richter. Um, BRW Architects, and they were the architects for the General Academic Music Project, and their contract expires August 1st. And if you move down, we have um, Strudy Collins with the MVP Engineers. Their contract expired actually in December of 19, and they were used on various projects and Central Plan, HVAC. So it's it's listed off to the side which projects that they you know that they were used on. And then I said, if you move on down the list, um, Naismith Engineering is the next contract that will be um, expiring July 1st. They were civil engineer for some projects on West Campus. And then uh, Joffe Holden and AM Tech, Rock Engineering, Datacom, Design Group, all those 
have already expired in January. They were also projects that have been completed and it lists the projects that they were working on. Uh, Turner Marmit is architects uh, for the workforce development project on West Campus. That will expire August 1st. And then we have, um, next we have Janak, Weaver Jacobs, Bartlett Cox, and Weaver Jacobs. All of those are projects that have um, been completed and their contracts expired January, February, or November of last year. To make sure I'm reading on those sections. I have a question. To make sure I'm reading that correctly, when it says project completion plus one year, so they're still required to come back to us within a year of substantial completion if there are ongoing issues or if we need uh, architectural or their construction services related to that project. Is that what I'm reading? Yes, from it's project project completion plus one year, but a lot of these, what I had is on the maximum expiration date, that did um, include the project completion in one year. So like the emerging technology, I'd have to tie it back to the date that John did, but it would be whatever the project completed, we do have one year past project completion. So um, yes, ma'am, They, if we did have any issues, one year past project completion, then uh, I think substantial completion is the word that's used in, in the language that, that we were presented earlier, then they would have to come back. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So let's go ahead and update that maximum uh, date because, for example, we just had substantial completion of the um, Workforce Development Center, but we still have the lab that is that is finishing up work because of the contribution. So that's that project, while, while the original stuff is substantially complete, we still have ongoing work there. I just think we need to clarify yeah. that John are you are you list yeah and I believe that was separate but I'll I'll, I'll, I'll go back and update the date Jason John, John are you John I'm here yeah no, you, you, the way that works the architects are responsible for the design and then through the construction and then one year warranty for that specific project so that's where the extra one year comes right. and so uh, the other work for the workforce is uh, not necessarily warranty work so it, it's uh it is separate work, it's a separate project versus being warranty work. That's where the extra year comes from after projects complete. The architects are required to come back and make a warranty inspection uh, and be sure everything is still in, uh, look for warranty items. But on the maximum completion, and I'm, I'm nitpicking here, if, if it was just substantially complete in 20 of 19, then their maximum contract expiration would be December of 20. That's correct. Okay. for other warranty items with yeah. that very specific project unless their contract is worded differently okay and okay. I can work with Tammy and review their contract okay yes and we'll work together to uh, make sure this is complete and reconciled so no we had to change some of those project completion dates in the last um, 10 months or so so if you uh, continue to the next section, which would basically be our section that's labeled 2016 bond contracts, of course, all those are still current because that is uh, very active contracts right now. Um, so if you go on down, um, we don't have anything that has expired or will be expiring. Um, it does give you some, like I said, some dates um, into the next few years of the contracts that be, will be respire, expiring. Excuse me. And then I think that Dr. Escamilla want to talk a little bit more about the um, impending contract or the agreement. I know that with Tradition Energy, I know that this particular agreement is in um, talks right now, and we're working on finalizing those uh, that agreement. It is um, something that we will, you know, when we do finalize it, it will be coming back to the board, and it's for Energy Savings Energy Consultant. And it was a vendor that was available on one of the co-ops that the board has already approved for the college to use. Yep. So Regents, again, um, I, th this goes back to the previous uh, item that we were discussing, and I think it's uh, worth talking about because it's a, it's a great uh, service that Mr. Garcia found um, out there, he and his team, uh, that'll serve the college and and so you know we we already again this is an operations piece that we already had permissions for to enter uh, these these preliminary discussions but what I want you all to know is that you know when we work with these consultant firms you know there, there are fees and so forth that 
that are way um, um, well I, I just want you all to know that those those fees that are that that and compared to uh, the savings that uh, that Mr. Garcia um, has with our our possible energy uh, provider, um, it was it was a tremendous uh, win for the college when we were talking about a, a, a long-term savings of over four million dollars. And um, just want you all to know that that you know when we're looking at energy contracts here, I think this will be my third one or fourth one that that, that I've been a part of since I've been here. Um, this has been the biggest win, and it has to do with the current environment and so forth about about buying um, into the future. Mr. Garcia, would you talk a little bit more about what that would look like? Or if you want, Regents, I can bring that to you at a later date with more details. It's just a, it's just a tremendous um, savings. When Mr. Garcia came to me, we made the decision to move ahead as per my uh, permission and, and, and direction, and I just think it's going to be a big win for the college. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Yes, so this is Raul. Oh, hold on, Mr. Cheryl. Garcia. I was just, oh, hold I was on. just thinking that you can bring it since it, you are negotiating, and that's an it, that's not a board approved contract, or Correct. is Correct. it a board? It's not a board approved Correct. contract. Correct, it is okay. not. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you can bring it back at a future the point FYI. in time, yes, okay. as no an problem. FYI. Yep, got it. Um, so the, the other question, so I find it interesting that, that you put that in there as a pending or as a possible, and I know that, that at least one regent had a question about. Um, advertising marketing contracts in the past and that that is not either a board approved contract either so those are those are some big multi-million dollar contracts um, or not multi-million but some big contracts not multi-million that was a that was a miss miss speak on my part um, that you are improving internally as well and so let's make sure that we keep this as board approved contracts Joe. Yeah. Any other questions about the professional services contract list? Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So the, back to the energy, mm -hmm. the, the consulting part is a professional services. So that's kind of a little, little bit. That's why I was a little bit in the gray area. It's not the energy contract so much. It was the professional services offered with a, gotcha. with the energy, with an energy consultant. That's, 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 that's why I brought it over here. Okay. And I wanted us well, to, and I wanted to If you're going to use that, then use all of them. Use, you know, bring the advertising marketing to us, th yes, those kind of things. And so that's, that I'm saying, let's be consistent in Duly how noted. you're, how you're working this list. Duly noted. So. Other comments? Okay, thank you, Ms. McDonald, for that. Anything else to wrap up your presentation? No, ma'am, thank you. I made notes of your comments. Okay. The uh, next item on the agenda is the pending business list. Um, is there, are there any questions about that? We checked off quite a few things. Um, we still have a discussion around when the uh, 60 by 30 strategic plan discussion is going to take place uh, as well as the housing and so uh, we'll look at that in agenda prep I think to try to plan out the next couple of months um, we're going to come back and have our policy discussion in July get a report from uh, the group about the reorganization and then bring our our board policies back forward I think at that point in time, some of the things we discussed in our board retreat uh, will play into that discussion if there are additional board policies. Um, so that could be a pretty robust discussion around uh, the board policy review efforts. Any questions about the pending item list? Seeing none, uh, we will move on to our consent agenda. We have items on the consent agenda, approval of minutes, acceptance of financial reports, uh, and investment reports. Is there a motion to adopt I'm the consent Mr. agenda? Uh, Mr. Revis makes the motion. Ms. Estrada seconds it. Any items for separate discussion or deliberation? Uh, I'm going to um, ask for, um, I'm going to do a roll call vote so that we can get everyone's vote recorded. Um, so. Ms. Hutchison? Uh, yes. Dr. Sherwood? Yes. Mr. Salinas? Yes. Mr. Adami? Yes. Mr. Rivas? Yes. Ms. Estrada? Yes. 
Mr. Bennett? Yes. Carol Scott, aye. That motion passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to the regular agenda, we do have one regular agenda item, which is a discussion of possible action regarding our depository bank contract. Um, straight to Mr. Garcia. Yes, Mr. Garcia. Yes, Matt. <clears throat> Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. President, members of the Board of Regents, we are currently under contract with Wells Fargo for depository services. It is uh, it is set to expire in August, uh, so uh, for, 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 we still have them for a couple of weeks. Uh, Linda Patterson from Patterson & Associate has been helping the college with assessing various banks and the, their depository services. Linda, if you can please chime in and talk about the RFP process and the recommendation for services moving forward. Certainly. Um, the, the second slide, if you can move to the next slide, you can see what the process has looked like. Uh, basically, the college went out in the beginning of April and released an RFP for banking services to encompass all of the services that you use from a bank. Um, there was a period uh, and a deadline for questions coming in and then uh, answers for all of those questions that were handled. Um, the proposal was submitted May 1st and, um, and planned to come to the board today for the award of the contract. You received two proposals uh, for the banking services, the one from your incumbent, which is Wells Fargo and also from well, uh, Frost Bank. Both of them local, both fine institutions, having lots and lots of services and able to provide the basic services for, for the college. On the next slide, uh, just an overview of the proposal analysis. Um, these RFPs involve many, many questions on all of the different services and we look at the service the services themselves look at the the service capabilities the level of service a lot of it now of course uh, dependent upon the technologies and the reporting process and the ability to move transactions quickly the second big element there is the cost of service analysis so we look at direct services we look at indirect services um, the every bank is asked for um, their input as to whether for a retainage or a transition incentive and those are incorporated into it. We also look, although it's difficult to even talk about earnings at this point in time, um, we look at the earnings potential at the rates that the banks have been given. This is this has been a, a strange one this year because of uh, the COVID and because of the rates falling and the Fed falling. Um, it's been difficult but it also will probably keep the the college on the fee basis uh, for the for the next contract at least to start it and finally then incorporating all of those together for the net impact looking at the services but then taking the costs and the earnings potential uh, together on the next slide um, the objectives that were set by the college for looking at banking services, and these haven't changed very much over the years, 40% uh, of it is service cost. This is a very expensive service. And also the earnings potential of when money is sitting in the bank as it's transitioning through and, and so forth, or it's being swept out. We look at the earnings uh, potential there and uh, what the banks are offering as far as earnings are concerned. 45% of the objectives um, had to do with the services. And this is the ability to do everything uh, online. Most uh, of your big banks, and certainly these two banks, are able to, prov to provide all of their services on a single portal. Um, the reporting, how much reporting they have, is it customizable, uh, how long is it retained online, those kinds of questions. And then the expert, the experience and references from the banks, and the finally the credit worthiness and stability of the institutions. So on the next slide, looking at the uh, the service analysis, we take every question that's asked of the hundreds of questions, and um, 
give them a weight as to their importance in providing the services to the to the college and you can see that these were very very close these banks are very very close now um, in technology just a few changes um, Frost came in at 475 points and Wells Fargo at 494 um, Wells Fargo outscored Frost slightly on automation uh, Wells has been um, Wells has been a leader in technology. They obviously, with a large footprint of an of an international bank, you have the ability to spread the cost of development across um, across continents. Actually, so um, the online services, although Frost was right there with them, uh, just a slight change, a uh, little bit of uh, additional services available through Wells Fargo on the collection services, uh, positive pay and reconciliation. You've been talking a lot about audit services and controls, and that's definitely where that comes in. And then on the wire transfers and the, and the way those services are, are handled. On the next slide is the cost analysis. We take what the banks have brought to, to the college as far as their individual fees. Both of them very, very aggressive in their, in their pricing this year. These banks um, obviously want the college's business, and you can see the gross monthly fees were 2,400 for Frost and 2,300 for Wells Fargo. So very, very close. And Frost was uh, a very aggressive. They have the fees that they're quoting are actually 40% of their standard fee structure for a normal corporate client. So. Um, they were offering a, a great deal and they also offered $3,500 credit for supplies and that goes towards deposit bags, deposit slips and tickets and um, endorsement stamps, those kinds of things. Frost was also waiving the first three months of service fees uh, and offering free deposit bags and deposit slips throughout the contract. Wells Fargo came back and offered um, five thousand dollars as a credit for supplies and they also offered a firm ECR earnings credit rate for the first three months of the of the contract period and that's the that's the rate at which money left in the bank would earn to pay the the overall fees so when those were added in to the the incentives were actually added in to the gross monthly fees you came out with Frost Bank at 2093 per month and Wells Fargo 1837 per month. That's really the key issue here now because of the, of the way banking is going and because the rates are very low on the front end. On the next slide, um, we looked at, um, even though it's not the time to use compensating balances and even though Frost is offering a, a good earnings credit rate, at a 0.45 currently um, that credit rate if you were using the compensating balances you can see that the balances would be less at frost than they would at wells but that's not a situation that um, the college wants to put itself in and using the compensating balances right now the most the more effective way to look at the banking right now and going forward at least for the first one or two years of this contract would be on the next slide which goes back to the fee basis that's used um, and this is a, this is a matter of using sweep accounts to get the money out of the bank on a daily basis into the highest uh, interest rate environment that they can whether that's a money market mutual fund or the pools or investments through the the portfolio so the Frost Bank on the interest-bearing accounts you can see was a 0.06 versus Wells Fargo 17. Um, not anything to, oh, I'm sorry. You should be moving on to the next slide. The slide that says rates if a fee basis is used, there you go. Um, neither of these rates are anything to write home about. Uh, but it is the environment that we're living in right now um, where the sweep accounts going out into the money market funds would be approximately the same. Those are going to be the same industry-wide. So on the next slide, the compilation of the fees and the rates, 
Uh, if you, for instance, use the compensating balances, which because of the low ECRs would be very high, that would be that $5 million or $8 million left in the bank, then that both of these banks are charging a regulatory fee on balance base kept in the bank. And that adds, oh, another 200 to $300 a month going back into um, as an expense. Um, that's another reason not to do that at, at this particular time um, with compensating balances. And then the low rates now and what can only be called cloudy or murky market conditions obscure um, quite a bit the rate projections. Uh, but it's safe to say that most banks will have to keep their rates low through 2020. Um, the Fed is saying that they're keeping um, the probably looking at the zero rate environment for the rest of the of the 2020 year, and hopefully the market conditions will improve, um, which would then allow either in the money market funds or in the portfolio itself to get better rates outside the bank, which would be again useful more on the fee basis than on a compensating balance basis. So on the next slide, the, the final slide, the recommendation um, from our analysis and from working with the staff very closely on looking at every part of this analysis is that on the basis of the services that are available, very close but slightly, um, slightly higher at, but certainly sufficient at either bank, but on the basis of the fees and uh, an intangible that you really can't uh, put a dollar figure on, but uh, with other changes going on and, and dealing with the other problems uh, right now, there would be no transition cost to Del Mar. Um, and so the recommendation is to award to Wells Fargo for the banking services contract. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Garcia and Ms. Patterson both. Thank you for that presentation. Are there any questions for them, Mr. Bennett? I do have one. Are, are we currently using positive pay? Absolutely. And does Frost not offer that? Yes, it does. Okay. That wasn't one of the factors that differentiated them. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Strada? Uh, Linda, or maybe Mr. Garcia, if you'll go back to the letter that you wrote to Dr. Scamilla, the very first page, I think we may need to make a correction there under staff recommendations. I think that date needs to be August 31st, 2024, instead of 2014. Got it? Oh, on the letter, not the slide. On the letter, the, the cover letter. letter. That, uh, yes, that, that Mr. Garcia wrote to Dr. Scamilla. Very first page. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, uh, okay. Um, For it says with one yeah. possible two year extension to August. 31st, 2014. So, so yes, um, um, I, I will have to reissue that letter. I do apologize for that error. Thank okay. you. That's it. Thank you, okay, Mrs. Strada. Keep you on your toes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I, I just have one question, either Linda or Raul. Why, uh, every time we do this, how come there's not more interest in being our depository? We normally don't have more than a couple of people. Uh, the banks, banks the banks are now ever since the 0809 uh, recession um, at that point because of the stability of the banks they were put under very heavy regulation some of it involves uh, their liquidity ratios their leverage le ratios and their um, stability uh, for their clients and all of that plays against public money because public money over the FDIC limit has to be collateralized and it actually lowers their liquidity and raises their leverage. Um, plus the fact that uh, banks now really want to be more service oriented and not uh, just a depository, just not to, to leave money there. They can't make money off of it, especially in a flat curve. So um, we're just as public entities, just not as attractive anymore and um, this is a situation that is everywhere um, you're lucky if you get two and three bids okay 
Without any further questions, I'm going to ask for a motion to award banking services contract to Wells Fargo Bank with the initial service to begin September 1st, 2020 and extend through August 31st, 2022 with one possible two-year extension to August 31st, 2024. Mr. Bennett makes that motion. Second. Second by Dr. Adami. I'm going to go in reverse order for a roll call vote. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Ms. Estrada? Mr. Rivas? Yes. Dr. Adami? Yes. Uh, Mr. Salinas? Yes. Dr. Sherwood? Yes. Ms. Hutchison? Yes. And Carol Scott, uh, yes, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you very Thank much you. for that work uh, on our behalf again. Um, with no nothing else on our regular agenda, the board is now going to go into closed session under Texas Government Code 551.071 regarding possible or contemplated litigation or legal claims or a settlement offer with possible discussion and action in open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel with possible discussion and action in open session and under Texas Government Code 551.074A1 regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, dis discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, including annual evaluation of the college president and the annual board self-evaluation with possible discussion and action in open session. The time is 3.54 p.m. We'll take about a five-minute recess to uh, clear the room and reset the video controls. Okay, the board has returned from closed session at 5.12 p.m. Uh, we do have an action item coming out from um, closed session asking for approval of the uh, Board of Regents action plan for 2021. Is there a motion to adopt that board action plan? Regent Estrada makes that motion. Regent Bennett seconds the motion. Um, I'm going to do a roll call vote. Uh, and please say aye. Dr. Adami, say aye or no. Aye. Regent Estrada? Yes. Uh, Regent Bennett? Aye. Regent Hutchison? Regent Hutchison? No. What? I'm sorry, I missed your words. Uh, yes. <laughs> Regent Sherwood? Yes. And Regent uh, Salinas? Yes. I should just say say not a, say in the affirmative whatever words you want to use. I vote yes. That that motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you very all very much for your hard work on that board self evaluation. Uh, we do not have any other business. We do have a calendaring update. If any, Dr. Escamilla, I think uh, we our next board meeting is July the. 14th, July the 14th, and we do not have a meeting scheduled before then. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Pettis to send us all an email with the suggested dates and times for the budget workshops through July and August so that we can all make sure that we have those dates uh, on our calendar for, the few, for those next couple of months. And with no other business, the meeting is adjourned at 514 p.m. Thank you all very much.